Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome to another episode of Downtime with Downstar, episode 151. And today we are here with the legend, Jonathan Wong, aka JDM Wong. Jonathan, thank you for coming, bro. I appreciate it. Hey, what's up everybody? Thanks for having me. You're a legend, dude. No. <laughs> you definitely are, man. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, it seems like it's so hard for for legendary people to admit that uh, that they are legends and and the impact that they have had on the community. Well, I think it's just we are really fortunate to have been able to, I guess, make our mark yeah. where we did. Um, they just happen to be these really special times um, that I think if they didn't happen when they did, we wouldn't, we obviously wouldn't be the people we yeah. are now. And those would have affected certain life events or, you know, these moments that everybody looks back to and says, Holy shit. Remember when we did blank or when somebody went this fast Yeah, or we were in Japan doing, you know, the craziest shit. <laughs> and, you know, when you look back, it's like those were legendary moments. Yeah. But it took, you know, other people that we were with to create those. So I, I'd say it, it's it's a, a weird combination of just things aligning properly. Yeah, definitely, man. And, and two, being in the moment of those things that are happening and records being broken, stuff like that. Yeah. You rarely think at that moment, like, wow, this is something I'm going to be looking back at in 20 years from now. No. And <clears throat> I mean, I can remember, you know, before I, I was working at super street and I was just going to battle the imports and we would see, um, like the first 10 second pass mm -hmm. or the first 11 second pass, 12 yeah. second pass. <laughs> yeah. And we're thinking, Holy shit. That's you know, that's fucking fast. And, yeah. you know, I'm looking at my Civic in the parking lot that's bone song. Like, well, I think it could go 18s. And it did. <laughs> so, but yeah, you definitely are not there at that time thinking, whoa, you know, this is, this is going to set, yeah. you know, set things in motion for, you know, what's going to come. You, you definitely know. Yeah. And that even goes to like maybe friendships that you've made as well. You know, if you're not in this certain, certain show you don't meet this person you don't have that interaction and then realize that you guys click and then build friendships for you know decades after that i i also have to say i have a very unique position on having made certain friendships well actually a lot of friendships you know that are still to this day mm -hmm. you know they are the same as they were you know having you know i'm eventually would meet these same drag racers you know these people you know industry people like online, you know, was, yeah. I mean, before forums, you know, it was AOL chat rooms, you know, this is how I met, you know, the Bergenholz brothers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the guy who eventually start import show off or, you know, global time attack, these sorts of things. Like I made these friendships so early on, you know, that you, we literally saw the rise yeah. of the import scene from a certain, you know, from a certain time. You yeah. Know, of course there's a lot of, there's, some older guys ahead of me that really, you know, kick started the whole movement. But if you're talking about that nineties era, yeah, you know, import scene, like, yeah. I was very lucky to grow up in that time. Dude, that's rad, man. Yeah. So before we get any further, um, if there's anybody that's listening that's not familiar with you, can you just give us like a quick breakdown of who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I for the longest time was the was oh, was an editorial staff person at Super Street magazine. I started in 1998 at the age of 21 uh, as an associate editor. Um, and I worked there for about 15 years and I was editor in chief from 2007 through, uh, let's see, 2007 through 2014. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of, I guess. So you started yeah. Super Street in 98. 98. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wasn't even part of the original staff. Uh, I think it had, the magazine started itself in 96. Mm -hmm. um, and what I remember about Super Street when it first came out, even, you know, I would just go to the magazine stand just to read car magazines. Yeah. You know, at the time it was Sport Compact Car, Turbo Magazine. Those were the two biggest. And then one day this 
thing called Super Street came along. And I just remember the the one very thing, the very vivid memory I have of that first issue that they came out with was the, you know, the first 10 second Honda. Was, oh, okay. Uh, Dave She's, um, you know, the Wicked Racing Silver Bullet CRX. Okay. And I just remember, oh, this is great. Because back then, you know, unlike now social media, you can find pictures of everything, information, anytime you want. Back then, the magazine was your social media. It was your only source of information. So... Uh, you know, if I found multiple magazines with the same car, I love that because I said, I just want to see more pictures of, wow. because if you're, you're not there to see it, you won't know. Yeah. So you have to wait for this information. Come to anyway, but super street, the one thing I thought was really weird about it, I said, well, this is a magazine that's covering something that was a very, I don't know, Asian thing to do, fixing up your car. And mm-hmm. it's run by a bunch of old white guys. Mm. I'm like, this is wacky. You know, mm-hmm. like who are these guys? And it read unlike any other magazine. It was funny. You know, it showed you how to work on your, you know, you do it yourself. Yeah. Tech installs. You know, I you know, I said, oh, I use it to work on my own car, actually. So that, you know, eventually, two years later, when I met one of the the editors, you know, at any of those one, one of these jobs I was working at, I was working at this company where uh, they imported uh, Duluc body kits. Okay. You know, some, some, these Japanese body kits. And one of the editors came by to do a story, a tech install. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, he, you know, he started talking to me. Oh, you know, we're looking for an editor. At that time, I was also shooting just not anything crazy. I wouldn't call myself a professional photographer by any means. Not, you know, just point and shoot camera. Yeah. But I was shooting photos for Import Show Off had a magazine out at the time. It was called SXY Magazine. So it was okay. a front to back magazine that they just, I can't remember if they gave it away or... It was like a small, I don't know, subscription fee. Was that a regular size magazine or like one of those little Regular small? size, but it was um, dual cover. So you could read it one way and you flip it. It's oh, okay. another one. Yeah. Got so you. so you, one, you read it one direction. It's mostly about cars and you flip it over and the other side is about lifestyle. So oh, like cool. Girls and got you, know, you, got you, you got know, you. Like fashion and nothing crazy. Mm-hmm. So I was just shooting a few photos there. So I told the super shoot editor that came by. I said, oh, I said, oh, I, I've been shooting photos. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a good writer, but I was okay in school writing papers. So he said, oh, why don't you just apply? I said, okay. So sent a resume in, um, got an interview, and, uh, you know, I, I uh, bugged him for a good month afterwards. Yeah. I ran into him at, like, some drag race at Pomona. Yeah. Like a month later, I said, hey, are you guys still hiring? Are you guys still uh, considering my, my <laughs> you know, my application? <laughs> Whatever. I, yeah. don't, I don't remember. I just remember I was, I was just nervous about it. Yeah. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like, just, you know, just chill, chill. We're, we're, we're still, you know, going through the process and, you know, we'll let you know. We'll let you yeah. know. And then, uh, then I got a call two weeks later and they were like, hey, we want to offer you this job. Nice. You know, we're going to pay you $27,000. At the time, I was like, Oh fuck! Like salary? Lot. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I was working these random minimum wage jobs, and I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm gonna do it. Nice. Yeah. So that's where it all started. That's at. where it all started. I bug, I bugged the editor in chief, Matt Pearson, you know, for a good, yeah, you know, like I said, month. So when that first issue came out, was that like the buzz on the street? Yo, this this new magazine coming, or was it just one day you went into like Hughes or something? <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I. I couldn't, can't speak from a industry point of view of, oh, where does this magazine come from? But as an enthusiast, yeah. I was truly just a regular guy. I was like, oh, this is, it's, like I said, it's just different than the other ones. But mm-hmm. it was nice to have another option, mm-hmm. you know, when it came to um, finding information and looking yeah. at pictures of cars. That's crazy. Back in 98, I was probably doing the same thing, but with WWF magazines. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. WWF and then it was uh I think it was Nintendo Power. Yeah. That had that one. Yeah. Because I would have all the cheat codes and stuff and you would have to wait to yeah. like get uh smoke on Mortal Kombat or something <laughs> yeah, like exactly. that. Exactly. But that's dope, man. So ninety six you found out about the magazine. Let's yeah. let's take it back to ninety six. What what did your life look like back then? Ninety six, I was a year out of high school. Um I think it was just messing around with my friends mostly. We had a little car club. Yeah. Um, Mac Cross 7. I mean, we were just a bunch of, I don't know, looking back, just a bunch of hood, you know, Asian dudes. 
Yeah. You know, smoking cigarettes at our <laughs> friends' houses and playing cards all night. And Did you do it like hard, a hard smoke and then slowly brought it in? That was a lot of, <laughs> you know, Asian squatting, <laughs> smoking Marlboro Reds and, you know, and, and, you know, we would fix up our cars. Yeah. Um, we'd, uh, you know, some of us would go street racing. Uh, not a lot of us were fast. There was, you know, maybe one of us that had the money to fix up a car pretty nice. Yeah. You know, I remember one of my good friends, one of my best friends to this day, he had a 95 GSR that he painted yellow, put a type R front end, turbocharged it. You know, Dr. Charles drove it for, or was it Dr. Charles or... Me and my friend, I they drove it to ten seconds. It hit ten. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and then even you know with my with our car club, you know we we actually won <laughs> import show off team represent once, and we were that we were that car club that was known as having we we kind of established that fake veil side body kit trend. Uh huh. Yeah. So we kind of made that a thing. What what is that? You had the replica kit, or yeah, because uh, you know we didn't have you know. The body kits out were actually made by Veilside uh-huh. for specific cars. Oh, okay, we got had, you. You know, Honda Accords and Preludes that yeah. you know they would take the same style of the bumper and make it for that car. So oh, okay, it's obviously got you. not made by Veilside. <laughs> it was like a VIS bike. Yeah, yeah. Was that a uh, was that ever looked down upon back in the no, day? No, not then. I mean, that was the time where you could, you know, change the tail light, you know, super tail light conversions on a CRX or mr2 side vents on something else yeah. it was kind of encouraged to have you know weird gotcha. front end, you know re- weird tail lights and fish tanks head- and shit yeah <laughs> you know and it wasn't until i don't know that whole you know when the jdm thing you know came in that oh we're, was, we're that, definitely gonna get there yeah, for sure that's when people would say oh that's that's ricey yeah but yeah you know when we were doing the honda thing in the beginning it was very innocent so what is your earliest memory of you being into cars? And was it Hondas at first? No. Um, my dad got me into cars. He always took me to uh, auto shows when mm-hmm. they came into town. He was very much a, uh, we were very much, you know, we were dreamers. We would, you know, look at the Ferraris, the Porsches, mm-hmm. um, or the, you know, the Nissan 300Zs, you know. You know, there's pictures of me in photo albums where my dad would, put me in his you know car seat and he'll write someday you know, uh-huh. like someday you know and i was always reading motor trend magazines you know cutting out pictures of ferrari f40s yeah you know lamborghini countach these were my dream cars when i was a kid mm-hmm. um and then later on uh like even when i was 11 my dad bought you know, an 89 240SX. So that's like the S13 nice. chassis, you know, but at that time I'm not thinking about any, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not anywhere near that, you know, not until later on years down the road, you know, that car, you know, sorts sort of becomes cool. You know, even high school, it's like, Oh, it's a 240. It's not that cool. Cause it's got the truck engine. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have the Japanese turbo engine. And then much later on, you know, I wound up selling it cause I was, you know, when I should have kept it and built that car. Yeah. But, um, uh, I guess the it wouldn't have been until I was maybe sixth grade, yeah, so eleven when I actually have some cousins of mine. They're one generation older than me, so they're probably about you know five to eight years older. Mm-hmm. They were they are part of that OG SoCal like really scene of fixing okay. up Japanese imports. Okay, so they have you know these mid eighties Celicas, CRX. Um, I remember one cousin had all the HKS stuff on his car. You know, another one, you know, they're hanging out with the guys that, you know, they're they're putting super fins and they got, you know, these Mugen stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, I still don't know what that is at the at the time, mm-hmm. you know, but I just remember, you know, these loud cars coming by, you know, they pick me up and we just go cruise, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Wow. So when you guys would go out cruising, would you go to like uh, meets or anything like that? No. It was I think, mostly. Yeah. I, yeah. Back in the late 80s, early 90s. Yes. Yeah, just cruising around. Be cool. You yeah. Know? Nowhere in particular. Just driving um, to drive. Yeah. I love I'm it. Kind of. It's such a long time ago. I don't really remember where we where we went to. 
Um, but certainly when I got my license and I got my first car, you know, those, those are times I can remember. Yeah. So where did you grow up at and where was all this taking place at? Uh, I grew up mostly in Pasadena. Okay. Uh, so I'm born and raised in LA, Mm -hmm. born in Hollywood. Yeah. Mostly raised in Pasadena. Um, went to, went to high school in South Pasadena. So that's where I met, um, you know, most of my best friends to this day. Um, one of them is, he's the co-founder of, uh, Titan seven wheels. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like I said, I have a lot of, you know, friendships and relationships in this industry that go back to, you know, those, those early years. Yeah. Titan seven's blowing up, man. Yeah, it is. They've got some nice looking stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I seen uh, they posted a picture not long ago of a M4 with some wheels mm-hmm. on it. I'm like, man, that looks really good. Look good on yours. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Shout out to them. Man. I know a guy there. <laughs> <laughs> Dope. So, um, besides cars and everything, what what did your life look like when you were, uh, you know, high school, junior high? What what was your what was your life like? What did you in, get into? What did uh, you do in junior high? I was into. Uh, I think I was into collecting a lot of sports cards, mm. basketball, baseball. Um, I loved, you know, Michael Jordan. Yeah. I loved uh, the uh, Portland Trailblazers. Uh, like I I remember being still collecting my first pairs of Jordans back in the day or like Reebok pumps. Mm. So, I mean, uh, I mean, to this day, I'm still a big sneakerhead. But back then, for sure, that love of sneakers first k- kicked in. Um, I was big into hip hop. I'm, oh, I'm a really? big, I'm a big old school hip hop fan. Um, I think I've, I've always, you know, since, uh, she suppose probably the first album I got on cassette was probably, I don't know, the beastie boys, yeah. license to ill or something. Um, but I've, yeah, throughout high school, I've always been into listening to music a lot. So yeah, let, let's tap into that, dude. Yeah. Music is like one of my biggest passions. Yeah, it's it's like right there with cars. And mm-hmm. I always say it like if I had to pick one or the other, I don't want to have to pick because it's not gonna be cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So what what kind of stuff were were you into, Beastie Boys, and what got you into uh, music as as like a passion rather than just a regular pastime? Um. I mean. I think I've always been to, I think I've always been musical. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my parents, they would buy me uh, Star Wars soundtracks on, on vinyl. Mm-hmm. You know, there's pictures of me listening to it with headset, you know, headphones. Yeah. Um, I'd listen to it for hours. hours just that one just song? Mu- just music soundtracks. Yeah. I would listen to hours on end. Um, I play the violin. Oh, cool. Uh, f- maybe from the age of, I don't know, four through 10. Wow. And then one day I just quit. Yeah. I just, I was so (laughs) sick of going. Um, Even though I think my violin teacher at the time had told my mom, you know, if if he stays on course, he could actually be really, you know, he's actually gifted. I don't, Mm. I don't know if I would become anything like a professional, you know, violinist, but um I mean, I, I picked up DJing later on in probably in my 30s. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't something I could afford to do in high school. Um, but I, I spent all, all my money in junior high school on cassettes. Yeah. So all I did was I would just listen to music. Did you gravitate towards any sort of uh, sound or like coast or anything like that? Um, I was definitely more East Coast. Um, I was Same. always... Uh, you know, at that, at that age in junior high, I was always, again, going to the magazine store or the magazine racks to look up, uh, you know, hip hop magazines mm-hmm. too. Cause I, you know, when you're, I felt like being in LA, there wasn't, I, I remember them being like K day, you know, to listen to, you know, West coast yeah. rap. But at the same time, you know, aside from the beastie boys are like the fresh Prince and jazzy Jeff, you're, you're a little bit isolated growing up in the suburbs. So trying to find new music aside from me going to the store and just, you know, blindly, I didn't know who to pick. Mm-hmm. So I would just look up, you know, I look at these, uh, they'd have these compilation albums where it'd be public enemy, MC light, you know, a lot of groups on one cassette, yeah. you know, KRS one, um, you know, I just listened to them half the time. I didn't really like it. Yeah. 
you know, but I was just trying to, to discover the sound and, and learn more about it. So I'd read, read about them in the magazines and I'm like, oh, I like Public Enemy. Yeah. Okay, everybody, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors and we'll be back in one minute. We all know that there's tons of places you can buy your car parts at, but when you really need help, who's in your corner? When you need parts for your Honda, you need to visit HeelToeAuto.com. Since 2002, Heeltoe has built a reputation for service and support. Let me repeat that, guys. Since 2002, it's 2020 right now. That's a long time of experience, man. These social media slingers and copycat web stores can't match Heeltoe's professionalism. Hilltoe even offers a complete OEM store for all your genuine parts needs. Whether it's for show, race, or just a badass daily, remember that HeeltoeAuto.com is in your corner. And guys, if you're on Instagram, make sure you check them out at Hilltoe Automotive. Please, please go to their page right now, add them, and comment that you heard them on Downtime with Downstar podcast. Next up is Downstar. Downstar is the premium leader in dress-up hardware and engine bay accessories. We have all the nuts and bolts for all your screwing and nutting needs. From engine kits, transmission kits, mount kits, clutch lines, brake kits, t-shirts, skateboards, hats, lighters. Damn, we got it all. We we actually have too much, guys. So if you can, please come over and buy some stuff at downstarring.com or check us out at Instagram at downstar. Make sure you give us a follow. Now, back to the show. So I, I knew about NWA because I, you know, read about, you know, how controversial these guys are. Yeah. And uh, mostly because I wanted it. I wanted this album because it had the, the parental advisory sticker, which was <laughs> new at the time, you know, and it was, you know, I asked the guy, hey, can I, can I buy this album anyway? Yeah. He knew I wasn't 18 or whatever the age restriction was. I was like, just let me buy it. You know, uh -huh. he's like, all right, whatever. Right. And I, I remember I played it. My mom heard, she goes, what are you listening to? She goes, what the hell is this? I go, oh, no, nothing. I'll just, you know, <laughs> I'll just put it away. You know, never let it list, you know. That's, so that's when it first came out with that CD no. or with that album, I mean? Oh, Straight Outta Compton came out in 88. Uh -huh. So I was 11. But that's when the par parental advisory yeah, came out? somewhere around that. It was either because of them or Two Live Crew, some, something oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right. So it was right in that era of that, you know, just when all the, you know, that good old school hip hop was, you know, yeah. getting, you know, it was coming out. It was really good back then. That's funny. Yeah. Let me actually show you something. Sure. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so that tape right there, I, I always talk about this story. I was probably about 10 when that came out. I, um, and guys, if you're just listening right now, Snoop Dogg murder was the case cassette. And it's brand new in the Damn. package. So, Still um, sealed. yeah. So I <laughs> bought, dope. I bought that cassette at, um, it was Sam Goody. Yeah. Or, yeah, it was Sam, Sam Goody. Goody. That was yeah. right, right? Mm -hmm. Sam Goody. And, um, I bought it with my own, like, birthday money or whatever. Yeah. And I had a Walkman, a yellow Walkman. Yeah. And then I, I, um, I was listening to this on my Walkman and me, my cousin and my little sister, we were going to walk to the park. Yeah. And then my dad, he's like, hey, what are you listening to? And I'm like, oh, uh, my new tape. He said, let <laughs> me see. So I give him the, yeah. the headphones. He puts it on for one second, dude. And he takes out the tape and snaps it in my face. Oh. And I'm like, what the hell, man? What? I, I didn't say nothing. I was just scared. But in my head, I'm yeah. like, dude, I'm listening to NWA yeah. all day in yeah. your car with yeah. you. Like, what's yeah. going on? Snapped it, dude. I was so bummed out. And then it was uh, last year for my birthday. Yeah. My dad's like, hey, I got you a gift. I said, all right, what? What? I went to the house and he was like real stoked to give it to me. I was just like, that's weird because I'm already 34. You yeah. Know? yeah. I yeah, don't yeah, expect yeah. presents yeah. from my family. You haven't my got family. one in years. Yeah. No, <laughs> dude. Since, since I was 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then he gives me that, dude. And I just like start tearing up. It's so crazy, bro. That's... Because like. That's amazing. He remembers. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I always make him remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's so cool. Yeah, I was thinking. I was like, wow, you haven't opened it. <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't even know where he found it at or what, man. But it's brand new in the package, so that's I great. definitely get where you're coming from, dude. Yeah. That was and and two, like going to Sam Goody in the warehouse and things like that. You would have to discover the music. It wasn't like as blatant as it is today. Yeah, you 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 had to. Um, unless you heard on the radio, which I kind of distinctly remember there wasn't a lot of, unless it was K day. Yeah. Um, you know, I just didn't have a lot of outlets to listen. Like power one six was different back then. Oh, and was it? Played a lot of, they actually played a lot of freestyle. Oh, got you. Got you. Know, you like got break you. dancing yeah. type music. Uh, 
lot of Stevie B, a lot of uh, expose. Yeah. Um, like I probably wasn't until the beat came along, mm-hmm. 92.3 mm-hmm. the beat. And um, that was when they started playing a lot of hip hop on the radio. Yeah. And that was, yeah, that was, that was a great time. So when the West Coast stuff started coming around, the, the gangster rap, yeah. um, which way did your did your ear gravitate towards more after that? Was it still more East Coast or? Um, I think I always had a love for East Coast for the for the lyricism, yeah, um, and the beats, you know. So that very, uh, you know, depending on producer, um, but also, you know, when I was hanging out with like kind of that that bad crowd, mm-hmm. you know, all you want to listen to is gangster rap, yeah, and so. You know, for those moments, we'd switch to that, you know, because that's all, you know, cruising to that was a lot better than playing the East Coast. The stuff. lyrical miracle, lyrical. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'd rather cruise to some NWA or yeah. something all like that. All you want to do is you want to you want to cruise to uh, nothing but a G thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's all G funk. So <laughs> yeah. we would, you know, make these little mixed tapes and, you know, bump them in our... <laughs> Yeah. Bump in our cars, yeah. So when you were rolling around with this crowd, did you guys ever get in any real trouble? Nah, not really. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we were, we were just a bunch of, we were good kids, you know. Yeah. We we just wanted to, we wanted to look the part, but you know, we we try not to get into too much trouble. Yeah. You know, there were some there were some moments where, yeah, some of them got you know some of us got arrested for street racing, but not I, it's nothing crazy. So it was more street racing stuff rather than like house parties and things like that. Oh, it was everything. Okay. I mean, we. We did everything. Uh-huh. We were not afraid to. Um, we drove everywhere. It wasn't like we just stayed in our our bubble. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you know, and when the when the AOL chat room thing started taking off, I mean, that was how we started meeting girls. Because otherwise, you're you're kind of stuck. You are stuck in your bubble when you want to meet girls. Definitely, you don't really know anyone from say Torrance. Yeah, or uh, you know, we're not going out to Riverside. But you know, once we start, you know, going online you know you're meeting girls in different areas you know and it's kind of cool because we have no connections there so it's like hey we got we got to go to the valley Mm -hmm. or we got to go you know wherever it is and i wasn't afraid to meet people like i was always uh you know when i was younger you know i was for a long time i was only child you know so i didn't have a lot of friends and uh i think that was the one thing i was kind of yearning for, you know, when I got to middle school is oh, I want to make more friends, you mm-hmm. know, because I also went to a private school. So, you know, your group of friends is really small. Mm. So when I s- transferred to uh, public school for the first time in my sophomore year, that was when I, you know, that's where I met a lot of my friends. Mm. Um, you know, that that's, you know, I was always like looking to get out and sneak out of house or, you know, go cruising with somebody just, just to meet more people yeah. and like hang out with people that had you know, these same interests as me. So when you got into sophomore year, did you have a feeling like, wow, I've been missing out on so much my entire life? No, but it was just eye opening. You know, when, when you're stuck in a bubble, a certain type of bubble, you know, you, you don't see a lot of things. So it's kind of like, um, like going to TS for the first time. Yeah. You know, you, you, you have an idea from what people tell you what yeah. it's going to be like, but you don't really know until you go there. So the same thing is, you know, when you're expanding out of your social circles, you know, it's like, okay, we only have these same five friends from the private school or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you go to public school, it's like, wow, there's so many more kids here. And you don't really have to confine, like, and you don't have to stick with one bubble either. Now you can, you know, of course my, my core group of friends was like a very, you know, Asian group. But at the same time, it's like, oh, I had white friends, this Mm -hmm. and that. So it was nice to um, finally, uh, or... Uh, finally, but you know, transferring to a public school, I have the opportunity to just really meet more people. Yeah, you know. So on these AOL chat rooms, mm-hmm. um, when I was on AOL, it was mostly just uh, instant messenger. So that had to be. I still had to know the person, yeah, or know of them to get their handle. Um, how did these chat rooms work? Was it like a geographical kind of thing? Or? No. So um, there would just be. There were categories. Okay. Um, God, how did it work? Um, there were like different categories for countries and interests. Um, but of course, you know, being Asian, you know, and all of our friends being into this, the the one areas we always go to is like uh, Japan mm. you know, for better lack of Asian yeah. 
um, I guess, social chat rooms, yeah. right? And so there would be a room, for example, you want to download bootleg music. There's so there was a request a request room. Okay, you go into this chat room. You just type you know a request to a bot there's you know this is like the early days of a bot you know type in your song and it will email you the mp3 file really so I, I would download bootleg you know music all day long just email sent to me sent to me and it would it would take like 20 minutes to download a song because it was on a dial-up connection yeah. right but you know when it came down to looking for people to talk to there were all sorts of you know like um you know the i don't know the Asians in Monterey Park or, mm, or got you. Okay. You know, things like that. So you can meet um people in different cities or you know, sorry, talk to people in different cities. Um but the one room that that really where I said made these connections was the the import racing chat room. Okay. So this was very specific for car people. Uh-huh. So and even just the, these chat rooms are limited too. So it can only hold, I don't know, I can't remember, 40 people, whatever it was. Okay. And so it, sometimes you have to wait just to get in. You have to keep trying to enter to get in. But you could still private, you know, I am somebody, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. can, you're like, hey, you know, who's in the room right now? Like you can ask, blah, blah, blah. And then boom, once you, you know, once someone leaves, you you slip in mm-hmm. and it's just, a, hey, hey, what are you guys doing this weekend? You know, you guys want to go racing or drive? Let's meet up. Let's go get something to eat. Yeah. Um, hey, you know, or, you know, that's her, how we'd meet some girls or, you know, whatever. There would be girls in there yeah. as well? Yeah. Oh, there's all sorts of people. Okay. And at this time, it's also so innocent. You know, nowadays, you don't know who you're talking to. Yeah. You know, it was not like that back then. It was so definitely, you know, when you would, I am somebody, you know, or DM somebody, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, hey, you know, like, how old are you? Age, sex, location, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I'm 18 or whatever. I mean, we were underage back then, right? So it's like 17. Yeah. Um, female. I mean, you could largely tell by their screen name if they were a guy or a girl usually. Yeah. And then you're like, hey, you want to trade pictures, right? And you'd have to scan a picture. Oh, wow. Right. Send them, email them a picture. Did you ever scan nudes? <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely avoided all of that didn't do that um but yeah that that's how we you know that's how you get a conversation I, and it wouldn't be specific to that room but yeah whichever one you're in there i mean because there's all sorts of conversations going on and you know people are always looking oh is that male or female because you can just click and mm-hmm. just look at the pro- yeah we have profiles even if i'm thinking about it so you don't even have to say what's your age sex list sometimes it has it on there got you yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been such a long time i honestly can't remember yeah um but, you know, but that was how those, those, you know, those friendships got started. Yeah. yeah. Have you uh, ever seen the show on Netflix called Pen15? Yes. Oh, dude. Yes. My, uh, my wife, she loves that show, man. And, and I, I watched it with her. I'm like, wow, this is like a blast from a past. Yeah. Time capsule stuff. It definitely yeah. is, dude. Yeah. Especially the, the, the kid with like all the rock wear and woo yeah. wear and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's definitely, well, that's, that's probably more like late 90s type stuff. Yeah, yeah a little later probably more towards my my generation yeah, yeah yeah how old are you right now i'm 42 42 yeah, yeah. so i'm i'm gonna be 35 so that a little yeah, generation yeah, different too far behind. Yeah. but um you know that's crazy that you say about uh that you were able to request for a song because when i was in it it was like you know kazaa bear share yeah. morpheus that kind of stuff and, yeah and you had to like search yeah. for it and, yeah. and try to find a good song or what happened that was even better yeah okay um, so this was like the beginning of of peer-to-peer sharing music yeah i guess so um i mean i just remember the first time i discovered it's like oh great i don't have to buy an album yeah because you still had to buy cds yeah um and even having a cd burner uh-huh. was was pretty uh that was a luxury item oh definitely yeah. definitely so just to be able to download have like a, a zip drive remember zip drives so yeah like i got a zip drive <laughs> of 10 mp3s this is my album yeah right? this is my new mixtape right and you know then when i got a cd burner it's like yeah i was you know making my own it was nice to you know, not have to waste money on a full album that you didn't really care about yeah like uh um no limit uh tru album yeah. there's probably like three songs out of a double disc that i yeah. liked on there so i had a blow 15 bucks yeah, or whatever exactly, it was exactly. on that. Yeah. So 
yeah th- that was great and then i just remember when uh was it? napster came on yeah i was like holy shit i can download all these dj mixes and you know oh my god we were downloading so much so much stuff it was crazy yeah, yeah those were great times man you know the actual the napster era i missed that oh okay. but kind of all the um the the attention that was going towards that with yeah. like lars from metallica yeah. and stuff that kind of put it more on my radar like yo what is this mm-hmm. and then all the other clones started popping mm-hmm. up and it seemed like every month when one was great and then the vi- virus 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 and then another one yep. would pop up so there would always be somewhere to like p2p sharing yeah. of music videos and things like that Yeah, exactly and uh that's actually where i started downstar at from okay. selling cds bootleg at school <laughs> boot, bootleg cds is that where the name yeah, comes that's from? where the name okay. came from in <laughs> that's 2001 cool. okay. yeah uh, that's that's so uh, i remember that dude that was me and my big sister we would just like download music yeah. and burn cds and stuff and it was great times man well, i was also gonna say Another thing I was into when I was uh, middle school was uh, graffiti. Graffiti? Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like if you're from SoCal, I could already tell you, okay, with with just looking at you, okay, you're probably into this, this, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Well, and that was also one of the, you know, it's one of the key elements of hip hop. Yeah, too. definitely. So I remember when I was reading like Source Magazine mm-hmm. and, I, you know, you're looking at, um, I think they would have sections for trends that are going on in different cities. Mm-hmm. So I just very vaguely you know very vividly vivid not vaguely vividly remember you know see oh this is what's going on in the bay area uh-huh. and i would remember you know when my parents would take me on road trips or just driving me around to school or whatever before i got my car yeah you know like i would see all the graffiti on the on the highways from the magazine no 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 just like just in just LA, seen them yeah you know like like la is definitely very um very gang like you know yeah tagging a little less of the pieces but then, you know, when I read these articles, you know, like, you know, it's a lot, you know, a lot of piece, you know, way more into the, the art, the art form. Yes. Right. So like, you know, when I go up there, I said, oh man, this is even better. You know, and then obviously the East coast is totally different mm-hmm. on its own because it was on the trains. Um, but yeah, I was, we were, we were big on tagging. Yeah. Um, you used to go out tagging? Here and there, mostly yeah. at school. I actually got kicked out of school for it. Like expelled? <laughs> Uh, well, I was going to school on a permit. So since I wasn't technically a resident of the city, okay. I, you know, they just, they just booted me out. <laughs> yeah. It was super dumb. <laughs> what were you so riding dumb. on? I don't know. I think it was probably like a fat marker. I, I didn't actually get caught. Uh-huh. I think somebody narked us out. And I got to hear your tagger name. Bro. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it was, yeah, it was, it was dumb stuff. Yeah. Mine was Norval. 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 N O V N O R V E L N O R V E L. Yeah, was, was Norval was um, Shaggy Doo's real name. Oh, <laughs> and it was really? just, yeah, it was like on one episode I've ever seen a Scooby really? Doo. Huh. Yeah, his name's Norval. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I don't even know if I, that's how you spell it. Or yeah, what, we we didn't have the best tagging names. <laughs> I think at the time, uh, you know, when I was you know hanging out with other taggers at school. Now this these taggers they were different than the the car guys yeah they were different from the gangster guys so that's how i you know i would kind of you know mix up with different groups right? yeah because you know the the taggers they would also be the break dancers mm-hmm. you know so they were they're were always in like little different circles right so when i would go to the taggers you know we would just compare like and we were just trying to learn new styles yeah like improve lettering so we i would just make up a name based on how this R looks. Got you. How yeah. you get the E to look better. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. about oh, let me pick a name that like resonates with my nickname. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't have any of those. Yeah. That's why I probably don't ever want to share my tagger name. Because, yeah. Because it's so <laughs> stupid, right? Because it's like like oh, because I got you know the E, the A, and the R, and I can practice. All right. You know, so, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's funny, yeah. man. It, it's crazy that like we all just go through the same kind of things, no matter what part of the the state you're at yeah you know because yeah. i've talked to so many people on the podcast and like yeah i used to do that too i used to do that too yeah i didn't think about it until i just i was looking at the wall and i was like oh yeah there's there's yeah. definitely some taggers that have been through here oh yeah definitely man this one and then um the guy who did this his name is uh cheech and he's though you've probably seen it he's the one that does like all those uh the cartoons the characters of like uh 
cars and things mm-hmm. like that. Okay. Um, it was real popular like last year. Okay. Um, well, he did the artwork in the shop. Okay. We have the big mural right there. Yeah. He did this. And then I have another local buddy who was on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a brand called Addiction. He's the one that did all the graffiti in the, in the, uh, the bay of the okay, car. Cool. Yeah. So it's always just been something that's really interests me. Like I was never in a, a tag or crew or a gang or nothing like that. But every time I had a blank piece of paper, I was like, all right, I'm going to same I'm gonna draw something out same, here same yeah every every long once in a while you know when i pass by you know n- now you can there's stores that sell the paint equipment yeah. you don't get sweated for it like yeah. you know, before it was all locked up they take the tips off but now you know I, you know every time i see an opportunity ooh, pen i'll just kind of just write something oh, yeah. stupid and just to see if i still can i guess right yeah <laughs> definitely man there's something about a blank piece of paper and just yeah. like a nice pilot pen or something yeah. and you're like man yeah i'm gonna chill here for the next hour and exactly. draw something exactly exactly yeah even some of the uh like t-shirts that we've done and things like that have been just drawings that i've just been messing around with and like oh, oh this is cool let me just scan this and yeah pull it up on photoshop yeah but i love doing stuff like that man so you go to the magazines you see the super street you would see source on there um what other what other magazines were out at that time that you were into was it like compact car was that was that a big one? Oh, you, okay so we're talking about uh what age am i here probably about after graduation well after graduation about about that time um uh, by then i've i've stopped reading music magazines oh really yeah um I think, uh, yeah, I'm still heavily into car magazines. So that Sport Compact Car, Turbo, Import Tuner is out by then. Um, Super Street. Um, Was Super Street and Import Tuner affiliated at that time? No. Okay, no, got you. No. So Super Super Street was part of um, the Peterson Publishing mm-hmm. um, Magazine Company. So that that's that's the parent company that does Motor Trend. Gotcha. Um, Sport Compact Car was mcmullen argus mm-hmm. and then turbo was um kip kington you know, uh that was it was just kind of a um on its own and so an import tuner is a is a byproduct of turbo okay yeah got gotcha. so they're all all separate got gotcha. you eventually uh probably we'll probably get into this way later but you know that we wind up coming together yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. okay yeah but that's not for several several years later so when you're reading these <clears throat> magazines who are the movers and shakers of the the import honda community let's let's say more specifically like the honda community so yep. who are people that that you looked up to so um this will be the time that hks usa is huge mm-hmm. um Greddy, is you know mm-hmm. uh jackson racing um there's a uh, jg engine dynamics okay so there's a lot of um bullfrog good so there's a lot of these uh smaller uh not i wouldn't call them tuning shops but these are like um these are companies they were making parts to make these honda drag racers go fast gotcha so guys i was looking up to and these were guys that were just hanging out at, you know, the local, the local shop. Pit Crew was mm-hmm. my local shop in San Gabriel. Okay. Right? So Stefan Papadakis was always hanging out there. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like the LA guys, you know, and then the Wicked Racing guys, they were hanging out down in Orange County. Okay. So that's where the Bergenholz guys were. But, you know, I guess they, they'd all meet up and they do the street racing or they go up to Palmdale and do Battle of the Imports. Yeah. But those are the guys I'm looking up to um, for like going fast got you then you got the guys that are doing the co- the car show circuit so yeah. they're at import show off so these are like rj okay yeah, shout out to RJ. yeah we're looking at these guys because we're like damn i'm never gonna make my car look this good yeah i'm broke <laughs> i'm not even working you know yeah. but you know we're just working on our cars by ourselves we're learning how to install things by ourselves save some money you know we're kind of you know we're just a bunch of broke kids uh-huh. but those are the, these are the guys we're looking up to um Man, I mean, I have I'd have to pull out these magazines to say like it's these guys, these guys, and these guys. But for sure, um, yeah, I, I, like Stefan Papadak is to this day is like he is my idol because really because he had the same car as me. Uh-huh. You know, he had the same black 
91 Honda Civic that I had. You know, it's like you're looking at guys like, oh, he's got the same car as me. That's why you aspire to be like them. Yeah. You know, this guy's going, I don't know, 11 seconds. He's got a turbocharger. He's got a, a twin cam in, like VTEC engine. You're like, I'm never going to afford that. Like, yeah. How am I going to afford that? So you're always, you're looking up to him. Like, I want to, I want to go as fast as him someday. But you look at RJ and say, I want my car to look like, like this guy had, you know, if you read if and even, you know, he, he tells the story exactly the same to this day. It's like, yeah, you know, he sold parts out of his bedroom or whatever it was. Right. Yeah. Saved up enough money and, you know, did this and that. Right. It's like, dude, he hustled. Mm-hmm. All these guys hustled to get where they were. Of course, I should have hustled a little harder. But, you know. Was there a big age difference between you guys? No, I got you. We're probably all the same age. So they just they just found the the hobby a little sooner than you did, or, or put a little more time in it than you did at, at the beginning. Mm, I mean, I can't really say, you know, did any of us work harder for it or not? But I think you know everybody has their own set of circumstance. So yeah. Of course, uh, you know, I don't know what these guys are doing for work. I definitely was not working. Mm-hmm. You know, I just had a car and I was happy cutting the springs, lowering it. You know save up some yeah. birthday money to get an exhaust and I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But then, you you know, I'm sure for when you're so focused and dedicated, like, you know, I want to go mm-hmm. X seconds fast, you're going to do whatever it takes yeah, to yeah, get yeah, there, yeah. right? So, you know, I can't speak for Stefan, but I'm sure he was probably really determined, like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work and yeah. spend all my money on this car, which is probably what he did. You know, same with RJ, you know. Yeah, it takes a long time to realize that, hey, this little hobby that I have when I do every once in a while with my buddies yeah. can actually turn into something that's like, yo, this is my life from yeah. now on. You know, yeah. it didn't make the trans- transition for me until Downstar started turning into something and then that clicked. But if that never clicked, it would probably just be like any other hobby that I have right now. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think about what if Super Street didn't happen. You know, what would I be doing today? Yeah. Really hard to say. Um, That's why I say it's like really lucky to be at that place. Yeah. At that time to create that moment. Right. Which allows you to. So very few people get to say, I turned my hobby into my profession. Yeah. Right. So like when people say, oh, when you do something you love, it's never going to feel like a day of work. Yeah. Which is I'm super lucky to say that even to this day. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that's looking at it through the positive way. I always look at it through the negative because I could have been like a rapper or something. You know? Yeah. We'll never know. (laughs) There is some alternative universe where you are. I hope so. Balling in a different kind of way, (laughs) rapping. You're like, I wish I could just fix up a car. I can still, yeah, right? God, if I didn't take up this rapping shit. Yeah. I could be racing Hondas right now. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Now, these guys, did you ever see them at meets or anything like that? Well, like I said, I would see Stefan at the shop, but I would never talk to him. Yeah, what was it like? Super intimidating because it's like (laughs) I see him across the room like, dude, that's the guy right there, right? But we talked to the guys that would... We were friends with the guys at the shop. Yeah. You know, so I think just by being associated with them, we it was good enough. Yeah. Because then eventually they would work on my friend's cars, the ones that could afford to do it, and they would go fast. So you're just kind of sharing that that kind of, um, I don't know, those successes with them. Just, just, just being in, you know, the same room with these people is enough. Yeah. Just like I'm sure could just like being at the Kobe Memorial. Yeah. Like when you're there, I'm like, dude. I'm not anywhere near Michael Jordan or, you know, all those great ball players, J Lo, whatever, but to just say, man, I'm never you're never gonna get this moment again to say, I'm in this room with like my my heroes. That's incredible. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of that was like a, a much smaller scale time for me to say, dude, that's my like my drag racing yeah. hero is r- sitting down right there eating a burger. I still feel like that sometimes yeah, to this I day. Too. I do too. <laughs> yeah for sure yeah i would love to get um stefan on here it, it would be it. awesome man stefan you should you should do this <laughs> yeah it would um it would be dope to hear a story you know a, a lot of the reason why i want to have people like yourself on is because you know i've heard about you ever since i got into the community you know and then we've we've grown a relationship since then but 
like all this stuff I never knew about. It just depends on when you get into the community. Yeah. You know, I got in maybe like 2007 and that's getting in means like creating an NWP um, mm -hmm. screen name mm -hmm. and then just still trying to figure out stuff. And then you see like yourself or somebody pop in like, oh, dude, that's like super OG, you know? So a lot of people that I talk to now, they always talk about, you know, the days that you're talking about. I'm like, Ugh, unfortunately... I miss that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it is hard to relate, and you know, sometimes I, I, you know, when you, when I mention a couple of names, I can see like, oh, I'm not sure what that is, right? So it's kind of like now, you know, us, you know, if someone says, oh, do you know this rapper? I'm like, oh, sorry, I don't. Yeah, and they think you're old because oh, he listens to NWA, this old guy, right? Yeah, so, yeah. There's a lot of, of course, it's always going to be that way. Plus the the <laughs> things that I've been able to experience since I've been in it, I feel like there's stuff that I've seen that like the newer enthusiasts have no idea about. Of course. But if we're able to put this on wax right here, this conversation, maybe somebody who got into Hondas a year ago or sure. something and, and didn't even understand the significance of a super street, like why are they tripping that this magazine's gone? Nobody even reads magazines, sure, sure. you know? Then they can listen to something like this and think like, wow, I wasn't even born yeah, when there, you guys were fixing up yeah, cars. Yeah, there's so many, yeah. Like <laughs> I'll run into people now. I was only three. <laughs> when you started working there or whatever it was so that that must put me in the like same age category as their parents yeah which is also frightening to think of. definitely man but it, yeah. it's also something good to look at uh especially for somebody like myself because i see you rj you know other guys still thriving in the community and it makes me feel like that there isn't a time limit on this hobby which you would have thought before you know oh you're still messing with hondas but when you see dudes that are in their in their 40s or even some guys in their 50s and they're still doing Honda stuff, you're like, wow, if I play my cards right, I can I can ride this boat to see wherever it goes to. I would say the one unique thing that I've noticed about the import industry, you know, or sport, whatever you want to call it, is that a lot of the same people that were there when I first started or, you know, those you know, even before we were in an industry, mm -hmm. they're still here. That's the great thing. Yeah. A lot of people, like, yeah, some people have moved on, done different things. Of course, you know, I'm not, in, you know, not working in the magazine publishing business anymore, but, you know, there's, you know, everybody's still interconnected, right? Yeah. And then every generation or year we move along, we, there's new people come in. Yeah. You know, and, and it's I, very, I think it's unique. It is, man. It's really cool. And it just makes me feel a lot more confident that this is the right decision for yeah. my career. Yeah. It's not like when I get to 50, people are going to say, oh, you're still messing with those Hondas. Like, I, I, yeah, I, I thought I was going to have, I thought I was going to work at Super Street for a year. So I'll do this for a year, two years, and then I'll, I don't know, whatever yeah. after that. And then two years snowballed. And the next thing it was like, oh, shit, this is my 10th year wow and then i was like no way i'm gonna be here longer than 10 years and then 15 <laughs> years i was like damn 15 years yeah. dude good lord yeah. so let's get into it man 2008 sure. uh, 98 when 98. you started yeah. what was your first car before we get we get past that first car is a 1991 honda civic SI, okay black um never did that much to it just lowered it on springs probably the most expensive thing i put on it was the wheels got you so what'd you have on it uh, towards the end, I had some SSR EXC mesh. Okay. Yeah. And then I had, you know, a trust exhaust on it. Got you. Yeah. It wasn't oh. fast. <laughs> was that what you had when you started at Super Street? It was. Okay. Um, so I drove that car probably, I don't know, maybe six months or so. And then I decided, you know what? I'm making adult money now. Yeah. It's time to upgrade. Yeah. So I... I bought a car, uh, or I bought a EG. Nice. Off my friend Brandon. He's the um, he's the head honcho at Bulls. Oh, okay. You know, the clothing and yeah, video, yeah, yeah. video team. So I bought his old EG. It was a red one. It was it already had a like it had a poor man's Type R engines, you know, swapped into it. Okay. So it was like uh, GSR bottom end, B16 head, ITR intake manifold, exhaust header, and but then I took that out and I made my own poor man's so i got a brand so when i started working oh we gotta dial it back a little bit yeah. so um so that's about 
maybe it wasn't six months. Maybe it was about a year. So this is about that time where I'm starting to discover all this JDM stuff gotcha. on, on the web. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm on uh, I'm on the hybrids. Oh, okay. Forum, yeah. Okay. It's Honda hybrid. Uh-huh. Cause I'm just looking for information on, you know, how to swap an engine, you know, because I was, you know, looking at cars to, to do this with. And then I start seeing all this, you know, what's this JDM stuff? You know, I have no idea what this term is, but I only can relate to it because, you know, I've been going to these local shops, you know, and I'm already gravitating towards you know, this JDM stuff, but we call it Japan spec. So it was like, gotcha. oh, look at these one piece headlights or these cor- clear corner lights, you know, it was just OEM Stanley Honda, uh-huh. right? You don't, it wasn't called, at least in my circle or, you know, my knowledge, it wasn't called that until I saw it, you know, these guys, like that's FF squad. Yeah. Right. So I'm like looking at this, I'm totally intrigued by it. I'm like, how are they, how did they get this front end on this car? Right. Mm-hmm. So this is when I have the EF, right. And this, you know, a couple of their guys, they, already done the you know jdm conversion i'm like i'm like this does not look like my car how did they do this where did they get this from so this is how i start going down rabbit holes of learning about this and this is when i start writing about it in the magazine you know my bosses are like well we're just going to trust you to talk about this uh-huh. I'm like i'm like this is i'm like this is crazy nobody is doing this yet like we have to talk about this and that's when it just it sort of implodes and you know you know, pe- people think, oh, you invented this. I didn't invent it. <coughs> I definitely didn't invent it. Yeah. I didn't invent the term by any means. I never, I never take credit for it. Yeah. It's always going to be FF squad or, you know, TMR, uh-huh. you know, but I, you know, I, I will gladly say, yeah, I helped bring it to some mainstream attention. Yeah, know. that's a subject that I really wanted to dive yeah. into. So yeah. this is about 2000, if I get the Probably time Probably about, right. yeah, 99, 2000. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So um, from the time you start at Super Street to 2000, um, I just want to get that that piece out of the way. What was your task that you had to do? I was an associate editor. So I'm writing a lot of the departments, mm-hmm. uh, like readers' rides, you know, because I wasn't a great writer. So they needed to get me to work on my writing got you so here just you answer the tech questions you know i've got a problem with my chevy whatever yeah i want to install an air filter how do i do this or readers rise just very matter of factly you know joe smith's cars has a you know blah 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 exhaust lower to blah 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 and from you know ohio got you got you and every once in a while write a feature story okay just to you know, you have to, and this is for everybody that wants to be a writer. You just have to write, write, write anything, yeah. anything you want to get better at. You got to keep doing it, mm-hmm. keep practicing. So I'm doing this for a good year. Okay. Um, at the same time, I'm, you know, have to keep shooting photos. That's mm-hmm. this is also part of the job. So you're traveling to events. I'm, I'm being sent to all the events that people don't want to go to mm-hmm. the, these East coast events. I'm, you know, I, for the first time in my life, I get sent to these I've never been outside of Southern California. Yeah. Right. So of course they're going to send a new guy to all the, sh- you know, not shitty events, but these are, you know, it can be challenging for somebody when you've never been outside your definitely. Zone, oh right? yeah. And this is, there is no, um, I cannot use a phone to use GPS. Mm. There is no <laughs> GPS. I've got to print out map quest directions and Thomas hope, guide or something. Yeah. Ta- and I, I've got to <laughs> hope that I get there. Yeah. I'm stopping at gas stations in the middle of, you know, in Amish country. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> these people probably never seen an Asian guy in their life. <laughs> They're like, uh, you lost. I go, definitely. Yeah. I'm trying to get to blank fairgrounds. Can you tell me, how, oh, you're going to jump back on this interstate and go for 40 miles. Yeah. Like, okay, great. And eventually I get there. But then I would get to these cities and, you know, like, this is how I'm making friends, like outside, you know. Sick. Yeah. Because right? you have to. And that was another great thing about this was like, oh my God, I'm being introduced. I'm thinking I'm going to meet more Asian people. No. Mm-hmm. Also, like when you're outside of California, it's white, black, Hispanic, everything. Yeah. Um, you're meeting er- and everybody is so cool, so down to earth. And they just want to, like, they're like, we just want to hang out with the Super Street guy. Yeah. You know, like we never met you before, but you seem like a cool guy. 
come hang out with us. We're yeah. going to pick you up. We're going to go street <laughs> racing tonight or whatever it is. We're just going to, you're in this town. No way. Right. Wherever these drag, big drag racing events or the, it, whatever this show or event is, is I, so I get sent to these things and I would just, you know, I, I'm just making friends out there. Was you it know? by yourself? I would, yeah. Usually by myself. Oh, wow. Um, if we had the budget and if it was a big enough event, it would be a full staff. Um, so it really just, it really just depend on what, what it was. Would these be like nopey events or, um, it was a lot of drag racing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the nopey nationals was a big thing. So that was, think of it as, I don't even know how to describe it now. It's like the super bowl of East coast import event. It was, it was, it was at the Atlanta motor speedway. So it's inside of a full on speedway. So that's, that's a lot of room. Yeah. So it's a lot of. It's not just imports, but it's all kinds of, you know, low riders and you know, anything that they could cram into this yeah. space. So that was, we would do these, um, we would do these cr- cruises. That uh-huh. It was like the Super Street Tour. So they would start from different parts of the East Coast. Eventually it would go from Chicago. It was mostly, uh, I don't know, like Maryland, as far south as Miami, and then Chicago. We would drive, you know, gather people along the way, and then we'd all meet up at the Nopi National. Wow. We just have a big party at there. No way. So if you can imagine, so if you can imagine yeah, my first year doing this, yeah, it's like 98 or 99, right? There's like, I don't know, each leg has, I don't know, two to 300 cars. This is insane. Like full highway of fixed up cars. You'll never see this today. Wow. I've always wanted Sam to like bring it back. Yeah. Or someone can do this. Yeah. But, you know, I think people are too cool to do a cruise now. But anyway, and there's a lot of Especially legal. California. Yeah. But, man, on it was always during the hottest time of the year. So I never, you know, in the back of my mind, like, oh, I'm not looking forward to this. So hot. Right. But when you get there, you're, you're pumped. Yeah. Right. I'm going to the Waffle House. I'm eating things I've never yes. eaten before. And you're cruising. <laughs> yeah. And you're just making friends with just a bunch of cool kids along yeah. the way. Right. Um, yeah. It was. It was dope you know what i i really uh I, I can relate to that a lot when i first started out um very early on i started traveling i started in 2009 and 2010 was the first time that i um that i flew for for business you know flew out to tennessee for import alliance and the same thing man meeting different people meeting people that i would have never met if mm-hmm. i didn't put myself in those uncomfortable situations mm-hmm. so if there's people listening now and you have a booth and you set up at like socal events or whatever you know take a flight somewhere Go check yeah. out some shows on the East Coast yeah. because that that really helped the growth of the brand. Just going out and and doing that kind of person to person interaction. Yeah, because everybody's so used to social media nowadays. But there's st- I feel there's still nothing like a person to person interaction and Absolutely. word of mouth. You go to these shows that you've never met anybody there. People have probably heard of your brand from you know forums or something like that. But then you make those long lasting connections and I still have those connections to this day. Absolutely. You know, ten plus years later. And same. I'm sure that you have yeah, some same. of the same people, dude. Yeah. And it's just you have to really put yourself in that uncomfortable situation to 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 get that that cheat code. Mm-hmm. I feel it's a cheat code because I would have probably met a lot of these people down the way, but I, the relationship wouldn't be as strong as it is today. And uh sometimes you gotta just take life in your own hands and dude, that's so awesome that early on in your career you're being able to travel yeah i mean you kind of have to too you know again like i said there is no social media yeah so we are the uh the gatherer of information yeah that's why i have to make friends because if i got to go back to these cities i want to know that i have a source to go to okay where can you who can you introduce me to next yeah to feature their car yep or where can we go eat next? I, I want to try something there because you just don't have the information available to you like yeah. it is now. It's just so readily available now. Like people are lucky. Yeah. But back then you have to, you really have to make those connections to make more down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're, uh, you're at Super Street doing some <clears throat> of these features, photos. And yeah. Then, um, when did you I want to I want to really touch in on this uh this JDM term because I I can guarantee people listening right now don't even know that this isn't a quote unquote real term. 
you know um i've i've kind of loosely heard the story but i'm sure that you'd be a lot more familiar with it than i am so when did you first start to realize that that was a term for you know japan spec parts yeah it was probably around that 99 2000 like what what was it how did you find was it through the shops or was it on no, the, the very specifically ff squad okay yeah like i said i was walking through a show i think it was like a hundred per nights okay and i saw one of their cars uh -huh. you know with that jdm front end on, yeah and i was just like i've never seen that what is that i took a picture of it uh -huh. and then i think when i tracked them down on you know through the forums i was like you know that's when they're jdm this jdm that i'm like what the hell is this yeah Japanese, well, what is that yeah so this is japan spec you know but of course it wasn't like oh it's already there i'm gonna keep using it i think it was just something it's easy term. Yeah. It rolls off the tongue very well. Um, so I just, I just used it because I, I felt like, um, the same time I wanted to make sure that what I was writing about in the magazine was authentic to the, you know, you want to be authentic. Definitely. To whatever is being talked about at the time. And I got a lot of heat for it mm. on the forum. Like people would say like, who's, fucking super street guy super you know this ricey magazine why are they covering us like that was the underground it was like the underground hip-hop yeah you know, of the car scene right like you don't want people talking about this thing that's really precious to the underground yeah. right yeah, yeah 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 right there's, there's a Definitely. certain thing about like when people start talking like oh god i wish they went like i don't want any more people to discover this or yeah. whatever but i was just so you know i was so into it that i you know i had to write and eventually you know i became friends with all those guys yeah right like, I, like it just takes a little warming up you meet them in person. They discover, oh, you're not like you are a car guy. Yeah. I hope, hopefully, anyway. Yeah, are, yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. they remember, like you know, like after you know, you just you just need to warm up. You get to know them. Yeah. And you show them, hey, dude, I'm, I'm just, I'm just learning. Like I want to know what you guys know, and then this is why we want to, we want to teach people, right? Yeah. Because we want them to know the right information too. That's very. That was very very big thing about when I was learning about this JDM, I, like, I want to make sure I was getting the right information because there is no information. Mm -hmm. Not even, this is when the internet started to really take shape, the forums. There is no, there is none of this. It's yeah. only on one specific forum. So to get the information right, you have to make sure it's correct. Dude, that's so crazy underground right there. Yeah. Wow. So who was in the uh, FF squad back then? Catman obviously uh -huh. he's the, the the legend yeah um lee randall mm -hmm. you know he's he had the green eg and there's johnny there's there's dylan uh, uh i can't remember, i can't remember um steve was uh, novak in it um i think he was like a, a ff there was ff friends okay so got you for friends right so there's like a little yeah i don't know it's hard to say but the, the core group group of guys yeah. yeah from from what i hear uh it was catman who catman. started yeah, that Cat, term catman, yeah so probably is yeah uh, i'd love know, to have him on too yeah, man we got to get you on here catman yeah, he's 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 an awesome guy a great character um and i i think like i said that's where you know tmr is probably i think largely credit with being the first you know media to talk about yeah jdm so and they got it from you know, meeting the FF squad guys. Now, who shop was TMR? <laughs> TMR is that was a is this little magazine? Oh, it was a magazine. Yeah, probably about probably about the size of your notebook here. Okay. So, Toy Machine Racing. This this is uh, Rodney Rodney Wills. Uh huh. He he's another graffiti hip hop guy, super into cars. Mm -hmm. he, he's probably another guy you should have on your show because, like I said, the the everybody comes from a different walk of life, but very similar. Yeah. TMR, just write that one down. TMR. Um. I, I think I might have him on Instagram. Yeah. Because somebody will, like yourself, you'll tell me a name. People tell me names all the time, and then I'll just follow these people. Yeah. Because I want to know, you know. But, yeah, TMR is like an old school of a different, uh, sorry, not old school, underground of a different kind. Okay. And so they're very like skateboarding, um, graffiti, the JDM stuff. Gotcha. But it wasn't like I discovered. But they were, because it was an independent, like this, this is a guy making his own little mini mag out of his garage yeah right? so it's like this i remember it was a really high quality um i was like man this is dope like they got all the these other like street razors in there and you know car show stuff it's, yeah it's another again it's another avenue to have to look at um so yeah that that's 
that is where all that jdm stuff comes very from. cool man that's yeah. crazy like i'm saying dude i i didn't even know for a long time that it wasn't a standard term you know maybe something that japan used or whatever i definitely don't think it comes from japan and um yeah i it's hard to say it was is yeah it would have to come from Catman. It's, so we're coming close <laughs> yeah we're, yeah it's we're he's com- definitely the originator um you know i think we just made it and it just became this official term yeah you know after probably after super street so when you realized that that was uh you know that was a thing um having all of these japan spec parts and things mm-hmm. like that did that change the way that you uh that you looked at cars and you built cars um i think i always had that that was always part of my style anyway like i said I, you know i didn't didn't have didn't make a lot of money so i wasn't able to fix up my car the way yeah. i could have um but we when we would go to these shops we were always looking at these you know, without knowing it was called JDM, we were always looking at the Japan spec parts because right? mm-hmm. the guys were telling us like, "Oh, this is how the cars come in Japan, right?" We're like, "Oh, that's cool." Yeah. Like, I want clear corner lights, and you know, I want to change it so it's a little bit different. Yeah. Right? I don't want to. Ha- yeah, that's the point of customizing a car. Yeah. You don't want it to be like everybody else's, right? But yeah, you're like, oh man, you got to spend that much to make it. But those are the guys, you know, like when they were rolling around. Oh, I've got the JDM headlights and this and that. And yeah. Like, like dude that's the reason why that guy is cool you know when you're like a young buck and yeah school, you're looking up to the scene you're <laughs> like damn that integra is tight because it's slammed with the one piece headlights you know and the that, bumper pull and that's it no yeah. they didn't have that back then really no it wasn't so intense you know so in in high school it was very much just clear corner lights or if you had the integras and one piece headlights mm-hmm. and, and that's it mm. no, nothing else nothing nothing super crazy like oh find the light switch and it wasn't until, you know, I look at this FF squad stuff where it's like, they're like, oh, we've got the full front. And I was like, what's the difference with this front end? I know those headlights are different. And he's like, oh, but did you notice the, you know, because of the, the SIR hood, it pops up. Mm. I go, oh, now I see it. And the bumper has, you know, the tail or the, the corner lights wrap. But you need like a different, you know, core support and yeah, yeah, yada, yeah, yada. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I didn't know any of this, right? Because I'm just not aware you're like, oh, but you should see what else, you know, we're looking for. Yeah. You know, we're finding, you know, the different ashtray or, you know, the armrest is different. So, you know, for the EG, it was like, that's what I really started getting deep into because like, I was like, dude, I can get this, 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 just to make it different. Yeah. So what did you start getting for your EG? Uh, yeah. So when I bought that EG off Brandon, mm-hmm. so, you know, did you know, swapped all the engine out. And so I got rid of the poor man's ITR built, you know, I was already. So at that time doing all the JNM stuff, I established a really good uh, relationship with Honda. Mm-hmm. So I was able to buy parts for like a great discount, mm. basically employee pricing. Nice. So I got a, you know, a, a, a US ITR block, a spoon, civic type R head, you know, assembled a legit, you know, Whoa. poor man's, ITR engine okay put that in the car and then I was like okay well now I'm gonna go get the armrest the long the arm long rest, one yeah the uh the the white face the gauge cluster yeah the uh you know whatever the power mirror folding even though I don't have power mirror but it you know it has the you know everything built into it and the flare didn't I didn't do any of that stuff I I was you know I didn't go too crazy yeah um I think the one thing I was really looking to get was the the interior. Yeah. You know, when you fold down the seats, yeah. it has the plastic panels. And I the love seats it. Are, I always wanted to get that, but I sold the car before. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that interior is so sick, dude. Yeah. And then it has uh, the back package mm-hmm. tray. Yeah. And then that has a hook yeah. that you hook it on the top where yes. the hatch is and it'll yes. stay open. I, I love that. Interior. So cool. Yeah. Dude, uh, I for my EG, I made a subwoofer box that goes right there and it looked good. I got the vinyl to match kind of the same yeah. color as the plastics. So um, I left the uh, the package tray at yeah. my parents' house. Yeah years and then uh like a few years back i went i was like hey mom where's my uh my thing for my car and she's like oh i don't know threw it out and my dad's like she threw it away dude <laughs> i'm like fuck so if anybody has a black one let me know i have yeah. i have a gray one but it doesn't yeah. <laughs> it doesn't quite it doesn't, look yeah, good you have to uh, spray it or yeah. dye it or shout whatever. out to my mom yeah. <laughs> 
thanks for nothing mom <laughs> yeah but that interior is so awesome yeah. man especially with the long armrest yes. the floor mats yeah. and stuff yeah very cool dude yeah i loved it that's so crazy that that was that trend started that long ago yeah it, it is it is crazy that's i mean that's jesus that's like yeah, 20, 20 years 20 ago years, yeah yeah it is crazy so um you said you got a spoon head for the for the motor yeah so i was you know i would go into the recycler uh-huh. so that was a, a a paper that you'd buy for i don't know 75 cents yeah and i would just look up parts or maybe it was on a forum i, mm-hmm. I don't really remember but i there was a guy in pasadena um you know originally i thought oh is this really a spoon yeah you know, it's you know a spoon head you know but when you think about it it's like yeah it probably is i mean i didn't it wasn't it was just a head it wasn't yeah. um no cams no just a bare cylinder head was it stamped or anything i mean it had the uh i think it had like a green mark on it so that you could kind of identify it. but you know what is it was i would just say it's a bone stock civic type r head which gotcha. is totally fine because yeah. i mean that's really all uh you know maybe it was mildly ported but whatever i mean a spoon stuff is not is not heavy modified anyway right so you know i put my own I, I rebuilt it with all OEM Honda, you know, maybe upgrade with the, I don't know, Crower retainers mm-hmm. and valve springs. So it was a little built, gotcha. you know, not nothing crazy. But. Did that, did the brand have that prestigious name that it does now back then? Which one? Spoon. Oh yeah. Big. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, we would buy, I don't know if you've seen these, these are these, uh, hyper revs. Mm-hmm. You know what a hyper rev is? So no. it's like these, uh, kind of catalogs they would be vehicle specific you can still get them uh-huh. um so they would have like the civic this called the civic bible or the integra bible so they had you know spoon is all up in it mm, okay and is all up in it but those are like at the time they were like the spoon is yeah just as big back then it was today so when did you notice at super street that this was turning into a career versus uh versus a short-term job <laughs> Mm, probably when I passed two years. Yeah. Because I, like I said, I didn't think I was going to stay that long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, three years, five years, seven, I'm like, whoa, you know, I think I exceeded my parents' expectations. Because really? They're like, ah, oh, yeah, you can work at this magazine, go back to school afterwards, yada, yada, you know, mm-hmm. we don't know how long term this is going to be. And then, of course, you know, by the time I am ready to take on the editor in chief position, you know, I tell them, like, I'm, I was also at a, you know, there was a fork in the road. I was going to leave mm-hmm. and just forget magazines. You know, in 2007, I was going to just go work for the city. Yeah. And just get a city job. Yeah. Get a cushy, you know, have a pension and just have a boring life. But I was like, no, you know what? I worked this hard to get to this point. I need to, I need to try it. So, so what, what was the fork in the road? What, what was motivating you to, to maybe find something else? Or, um, I mean, there were, there's always been moments where I think, is this really what I want to do? Right. And, uh, you know, sometimes you think, oh, eh, it's just time to, you know, hang it up, get serious, yeah, you know, serious, whatever that means, you know, but I, I, I think at the time I was maybe a little frustrated. Okay. I was like, oh, am I ever going to advance past where I was? You was know? that your goal? I think I wanted it, you know, but then at the same time, I was like, oh, you know, if I, if I split off and do the city job, you know, it would be the low man on the totem pole, Mm -hmm. but I'd have that potential like in 10 years to be making bank, Mm -hmm. you know, but my goal is not to make bank. It's nice, but it's not, it's not the ambition, right? Yeah. I rather, I want to be happy doing something I'm doing, you know, and I was really happy doing that. So. That's why I stayed at Super Street. So about nine years in, what did you feel like your strong point was to the to Super Street? Was it uh, more of the the editorial side of it, or photography, or um, probably the editorial side? So by the time I became yeah nine years later, when I became editor in chief, mm-hmm. it was more about it was less less about me shooting photos because I, I knew I wasn't the best photographer. I wasn't learning how to you know. At that point, a lot of people were doing, you know, the photoshopping, the rigging. Oh, you know, like okay, gotcha. The digital gotcha, artists, right? Yeah. So this is these are like the Sean Klingelhoffers yeah. of the time. 
you know, Steve DeMitt, like I'm talking the really talented photographers of that era. Mm-hmm. I was not there mm-hmm. and I knew I wasn't going to be there and I wasn't trying to be there. Um, you know, but because of all those, you know, like finding, uh, trends like the JDM stuff or, you know, just, uh, finding the right cars, you know, my, I felt like I was much better at the editorial process, mm-hmm. more just, uh, you know, the knack of finding the right people to work with, you know, bring on the team. Um, you know, just, you have to know, or you have to have, have to have a, a good, um, I don't know what is it, intuition for mm-hmm. finding the right things. Otherwise you're probably not going to make it as a editorial, right? Like, gotcha. you know, you have to have some, you know, it takes a little, you know, work to figure that out. But when you can get those pieces, right. I felt I did. Yeah. And that's why, that's what I thought I was best at. So, so would you find this inspiration by going to, uh, to events or was it, going to, to local meets or you mean like how do i find yeah like like how did you know where the culture was going what what was going right. on what was popping uh, that that all relates back to just trying to connect with people mm-hmm. as much as possible so if i'd seen a car on a forum that i liked a lot so for example um charles true mm-hmm. you know who he would eventually join my staff okay and become an import tuner like he is famous on those Honda forums for having, you know, certain cars. So like I would see his car in an event. I'd leave my card, call me, mm. email me. I want to feature this car. Okay. You know, that, you know, this photo shoot eventually turns into a, a friendship. You know, I say, Hey, you know what? You seem like, a, like I can tell you're not a photographer. You're not really a writer, but you know something about cars. That is something I, you know, you have a stronger intuition about certain things that I don't. So you could be a strong player on my team. Mm. That's why I brought him in. Gotcha. You know, like I, I would not always pick, you know, the best writers or the best photographers. But like I said, you got to pick the same people that think like you to be able to help collaborate with you to create the product that I felt was the best to give to our readers. So that goes back to that whole, you know, notion of where do you feel your strength is? Is yeah. me? I'm. I feel I'm good at finding the people, the connector. You know building those relationships do you still feel like you have that talent i hope i do (laughs) i mean i'm still doing you know industry related work to this day yeah and i have to continue it's a little bit different now but you know i i hope i'm still doing you know same level or if not higher i hope yeah so when you got into the um the editor-in-chief position what were some of the things on your mind that you wanted to, to work on for the magazine and you know change around um i think it was just being able to finally put my true voice onto it right because before i'm working underneath somebody you know they have their they have their idea of what specific editorial direction the magazine should go in right they don't they want to do this they want to do that so when you are now in charge you are the one responsible for guiding the ship Mm -hmm. so it's continuing that you know making sure you're on the path of finding the right trends, you know, what do people want to read or what do you want to introduce to people? You know, so it's a common, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. Yeah. You know, so yeah, sometimes you have to give in to the reader a little bit. You got to show them things that they are writing in or, you know, emailing. Yeah. Emailing you about, Mm -hmm. I want to see more of this. Okay. Give you a little more of that. But at the same time, it's like, unless one of us had the foresight to say, Oh, we should write about JDM stuff. How, how would they know? And how would, you know, unless I speak up, how do they know what to take a chance on? So you have to, that's a lot of responsibility, man. It is. And you know, you could, there, there were months where, yeah, I, you know, I think, or we thought collectively that's a dope car and it would sell terribly on the newsstand. Yeah. You know, sometimes, yeah, you do have to take a step back and say, well, it's not just about what you are into. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because it doesn't mean everybody's into it. And then it was always the cars where you thought, oh, I don't want to put this car in the cover, but it's all we got or it's not the greatest. And then it wind up being the best seller. Yeah. So it always has a funny way of doing that. So what's the whole thing about having a like a black or white car on the cover? Oh, so black or white cars are the cardinal sin because they just don't pop Mm -hmm. in photos. They, they become, you you lose them. So that's why you always want something colorful Yeah, because it will stand out. 
black one it's just black or white they just very it looks very plain yeah yeah was that like a general kind of thing just to not do or it was you try to do not you try to um is a general general rule Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes the car is dope yeah It, it was very rare but it had to be outstanding in order for us to do that just because if it, it could have hurt it could hurt new sales and yeah make that mistake so when you jumped into your new position what are some of the the things that you did in those you know seven years that you were with the magazine that maybe um that you're proudest of um mm, <laughs> um i think it's just continuing that to build that um to continue being known as that JDM outlet. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people probably don't realize, but like, you know, like I said, Super Street, when I first picked it up, was very different than what it was when it finally ended. So if people listening or watching this, like the way you probably last saw it is not what it was. It was complete, like I said, it was, uh, content was completely different. Mm-hmm. It could have been viewed as, you know, like the other magazines, Sport Compact Car and Turbo, Import Tuner. They looked at us as, oh, you guys are ricey. You guys suck, mm. you know. And even from the day I first started, my goal was to get it to not be made fun of. You know, I really wanted to take on the challenge of getting rid of the stigma that we were a second writ magazine. Yeah. I wanted to be the best. Yeah. You know, and to do that, you know, I felt it had to really take on that that editorial voice that was going to prove, you know, we could stand on top. And that was, you know, making sure that the direction was always going that kind of JDM route. Yeah. Beyond the magazine, you know, the proudest achievement was taking on social media from the get go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were the first um, automotive print title to hit the million followers yeah and it's huge yeah it kind of happened by mistake because in the beginning when we all started we were like okay we should all do this facebook instagram thing i remember i said we need to do this instagram you know because i was already into it you know showing other people like oh, i don't know really know about this right and then everybody started their accounts and you know then it kind of became this little side competition oh let's see who can get to ten thousand followers first mm-hmm so like me and Charles, we were like kind of battling and battling, trying to figure out ways to build the audiences. Yeah. And it was the wild west, you know, yeah. like social back then you could build the audience like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was where the, you know, that was, I feel like that's also where the, the beginning of the whole giving credit thing came along uh-huh. too, because, you know, it's like, ah, oh, how do I get people to look? I said, it can't just be the cars that we're featuring because it's not enough. So I said, Let, let's just make super street all of auto, anything that's cool automotive fixed up whatever it is it's got to be a cool photo yeah right which is kind of what instagram is to this day something mm-hmm. cool so we would just, i just share charles will start doing i'm gonna put all ferraris da, 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 and then build them up so okay well i'm gonna do the same thing da, 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 da. and then you know eventually some people say hey that's my photo so i said okay let's start let's say okay photo by blank you know that it just gives them the props right? yeah yeah, then, yeah yeah you know of course that's a whole nother topic i don't want to yeah. but um at least that kind of satisfied the, the photographers, right? And then that's how it started building and building and building. And we're like, okay, we can't just put whatever. Now we can't put whatever photos in there anymore. We got to make sure the photos are great. And mm-hmm. now it's got we have to make sure it's ours. Yeah. So we would work on improving all that. And then it, was, it just snowballed. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're super proud of Facebook and Instagram hitting that million million marker. Do you have anything to do with it to this day? No, or no. no? I... I haven't touched any social media property of super street since I left mm-hmm. only because I, I don't, I'm not technically an employee. So, yeah. yeah. So let's get into, um, import tuner and Honda tuning. Mm-hmm. When did they become a, um, you know, part of the, the team or was, was super street always with source interlink or when did source interlink come along and all of that mesh together? Okay. So the, the company breakdown, um, for super street is P- Peterson publishing. Mm-hmm. Then there was some company that, that bought it out. I don't remember the company, but that was really short. And then it went to, I believe it was EMAP USA. So it was a British company. Okay. 
they did max power um uh, that's so that's like the og you know your uh uk rag right and uh um then after that uh oh man my memory's <laughs> bad uh so i think that's when we joined with uh McMullen uh Argus to create um oh god I should know this and people are gonna people that I work with are probably gonna <laughs> roast me for not knowing this but uh yeah it became another company Source was not for a while okay Source Interlink didn't happen until uh this is like 2010 oh okay okay yeah. okay but I think people just probably as Probably as far back as you can remember. You're yeah. Like, oh, source. Was yeah, 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 yeah. So during that time, yeah. So when you were getting into it, mm-hmm. that is the that is the company, the parent company of the time. Did you have anything to do with uh, Honda tuning? Uh, no, no. That was all rod res. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we yeah. we as magazine staffs, we never crossed uh, into other departments. Even when you were in the same building. Don't don't yeah. Uh, the only time that I would, uh, collaborate or, or work on other ones was, uh, we'd have these, uh, that's what they call special interest publications called SIP. So that, that would be like the, uh, project car. Gotcha. Um, so like the spinoff magazines, those are the ones that we would actually put a hand in, mm-hmm. you know, and, but yeah, usually import tuner or spark, they were in, they were in a different building. So one, you couldn't collaborate, and, and then two, they they didn't they didn't encourage that. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, yeah, we're one big happy family. So, at what point did you realize that Super Street was the uh, the premium magazine for the import community? New stand sales. At what what year was that? Oh, um, mm, oh, tough, maybe. I don't know, probably 2011, 2010, mm. something like that. Okay. At that, before then, what was its major competition? Yeah, Turbo. Sport, yeah, I mean, every one of those, even though you're the same company, you are competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your, your goal is to sell as much as you can. Got you. Yeah. So um, when did you start realizing that print was kind of going out the door? Um, I mean, I think we had, we were definitely thinking about it when, you know, the forums were big. I mean, I I always like to say, um, the internet killed the magazine and social media killed the internet. Mm -hmm. Those are my three, you know, orders of what's killing what, um, you know, I think the, the, parent company as a whole didn't probably didn't react as quickly and as strongly as it could have, uh, you know, when, you know, when the internet was building. So it probably could have had a much better presence online if they focused a little bit better on it. Um, but I think, you know, some people were, you know, the, the salespeople, the, you know, the head salespeople at the time, they were more concerned about, you know, making sure the magazine is the, is the top product. And it should be, you know, still to a degree, right? Because that's ultimately when people look at the brand, it's like the magazine is the anchor, mm-hmm. right? That's the the most important part of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, you know, the website, you know, that's very hard to, uh, also it's very hard to sell also, you know? So that was a challenge. You know, how do you sell the, the ad space online? You know, that that's the challenge. And mm-hmm. then of course, on, uh, social media is also difficult, you know, if you, if you don't know, what you're doing yeah but of course by 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 the point that we had reached the million followers you know a lot of that we were doing um doing that all on our own we we weren't getting budget for that so mm. by the time i left you know i i don't i don't have a part in you know how they handle the the, the budgets or the you know how they put in the money towards social media when uh import tuner uh closed the doors was that like a big red flag for you that you know tides changing um, I mean, that was at the time that I'd left, uh-huh. um, person, person from a personal level. Yes. You know, you, anytime something closes that, that just means, you know, it's just more a sign of the times that, you know, things will change. Yeah. Yeah. So come, uh, 
2014 it feels like we're just flying over yeah. so much <laughs> but uh 15 uh what 14 16 years you were there 15 15 years yeah. you were there wow what was the um what was the exit like it was not the way i envisioned myself being taken out uh, you definitely want to go out on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a little messy. Um, and you know, a lot of it's because I, I didn't really get a chance to say, a, you know, I didn't get to give a proper goodbye. Gotcha. So I think, uh, I mean, I, I have never really asked too many people about it. You know, people know not to, you know, unless they're like my really close friends, they don't really ask me about it anyway. But, you know, I, wouldn't have wanted people to think, oh, he just upped and left. Yeah. It wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. It was definitely against, you know, what I, you know, what I was doing at the time, especially because we had just hit all those milestones on social media. Yeah. We, were, we were on fire. Yeah. Right. And so, of course, these are just, uh, you know, these are changes in a company that is, you know, they had to do what they had to do business wise. And it wasn't just me. I mean, it was, you know, at the time, like I said, they took out import tuner, they took out you know, several magazines. So it was just another sign of the times. Was oh, so was that the same exact time that, that you left when import tuner? Yeah. So oh, wow. I was, I was a little bit before just right before. Okay. Um, so I think I was going to be part of like the big mass exodus, but you know, of course what went down was, you know, I, you know, got taken out a little bit early. Out got of the you. Game. Uh, but yes, it was all part of, uh, I think it was all part of the plan to restructure mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, take out some higher, ranking people from their positions so. so what what was life like after the exit it was uh it was kind of depressing um i always will jokingly tell people that i mean without having actually gone to jail myself i i kind of imagine you know what it would be like mm -hmm. if you're institutionalized for a great deal of time you know, and then you come out, it's kind of like the, you know, the old guy in the uh, Shawshank Redemption. When he comes out, he has no idea what to do himself because mm -hmm. I've been working there 15 years. I was so used to a certain way of life, you know, commuting to work, you know, doing my job, traveling, do this and that. I was so used to it that I, you know, 15 years have, you know, flown by in an instant. And then what do I do now? You know, your, your life changes and it's not the same, right? You know, I'm not hanging, I'm not having lunch with the same group of friends anymore. Um, you know, and I, I wasn't really, sh you know, people like, oh, you'll be able to, maybe you'll start something on your own or blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when it comes down to it, you can't just do that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't dating anybody at the time. So it was a lot of just, oh, what do I do? I was just by myself. I was bored i was depressed you know but the same i was like okay well i gotta get back into something can't just like collect unemployment that's not me like, yeah i didn't want to just sit around and also feel sorry for myself i don't want people to feel sorry for me either right so you know that moment i was you know sure i should i could have taken my time to think about what i want to do and you know you know explore different things but i just i remember thinking I just got to get back to work. I got to make money. I got a mortgage to pay. You know, I'm not a little kid anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, here I am. I'm, you know, what am I at the time? 30, 34, 35. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know, I'm thinking, Oh, I gotta, yeah, I gotta figure something out. 30, yeah. 35, 36. Like I got, I got to get back into something. Right. So that's when I, I went over to Ibok to go work. Oh, you worked at Ibok? Yeah, for a year. Oh, wow. What'd you do there? I was a marketing manager. So mm -hmm. Tony Jackson. Yeah. Shout out to Tony. Shout out to Tony, man. Yeah, I mean, he those guys were so cool. Like, you know, just really took me in, like one of the guys. And I mean, the the, the drive was far. I mean, I was going from Glendale to Corona. Mm. I mean, that was a hell oh, of a wow. drive. Yeah, yeah, that is, that's a drive. Yeah. Was that like an hour at least? Yeah, but thankfully it was going against traffic every uh -huh. day. Um, but I mean, that was a hell of a commute going in super early every day. But it was nice to just, you know, I was like, okay, I'm working, you know, like keep me busy, you know, and, and I also decided it, it's good to maybe get out of editorial mm -hmm. and, um, learn a new skill set, you know, cause I always, I always kind of thought, you know, usually the, the, the progression of a magazine editor is they will typically go to PR, they, they'll, they'll do PR work after some kind of marketing for like an OE, Honda gotcha. or whatever it is. Yeah. Typically that's the, you know, the, the, 
the the path the job path is that's where you go but i was like okay well i'm not i'm not going to go to honda so what can i do i said well i want to learn about marketing you know if i've been doing social media marketing you know like it's time to get into this digital space and learn just learn yeah so that's why i went there just just to expand the horizon a little bit did you uh find a skill in marketing um Yes, certainly. I mean, it's it's just another extension of what we were doing at the magazine. But now this time you're you're learning how to target certain audiences. Yeah. You know, like, you know, craft the language to make somebody want a product, you know. Yeah. That sort of thing. So what uh, what was the reason for leaving Eibach? Uh, let's see. I think they, I, they, I think they decided they didn't need the position. Yeah. And it was fine because gotcha. it, was, it was kind of far and um, I knew I wasn't going to be there super long term but right after that i went to driving line so that is uh nitto tires okay um brand marketing extension kind of you know content space mm-hmm. so going there was just like back at super street yeah but in a different place a different name but i had to do a lot of truck stuff mm-hmm. so that was it was fun again doing car stuff it's like oh here i am back at auto salon yeah i think that was the year that we well yeah. together 2017 something like that maybe? 16 15 somewhere in that time gotcha. frame. yeah no i i actually want to hop into auto salon i had that on my list but before we get away from um you leaving super street yeah when you left did you realize that maybe your your social circle changed or maybe people that you had relation business relationships change once you weren't in the position to be beneficial to them there yeah i mean there's a very small handful um but at the same time i would never consider those people like it kind of you kind of know who's got your back and who doesn't and it's really during those those trying times you know of course all my all the people i can count on they were always there got you so i i never felt uh, i never felt alone i mean yeah of course bummed out but never truly alone and, you know, of course, the people that were, you know, that would hit me up at the magazine, of course, I knew they were going to drop out because now I can't do anything for them. Yeah. So it's it's normal. It comes with the territory. Definitely, man. So when was your first year going to uh, not only Auto Salon, but to Japan? Well, that would be the first year I went to Japan. It was okay. Auto Salon in 2001. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what did it look like then? Um... I'm pretty sure it's you probably have the same reaction as me when you're walking out of that terminal to get into the car yeah. or the shuttle bus and you're you're you know you're you're jet lagged as shit <laughs> but you know you're looking out the window and you're like oh dude a Civic Type R just drove by or a Skyline just you're like you're like holy <laughs> fuck dude I'm in this country right now like you know yeah you're doing all the newbie things that everybody does it's always the same every year it's that first year is like dude oh let me get the face mask <laughs> and i'm gonna buy the you know the drink from the vending machine the corn drink, the from corn the vending, drink yeah. and i'm gonna go to the <laughs> up garage or the um you know the the shop and i'm gonna buy all these <laughs> trinkets for my friends yeah, it's the exact same thing <laughs> i did the exact same thing when I, the first time i went i was yeah. blown away but again it wasn't there was no social media hardly on the internet yeah and um first time i went uh yeah it was mind-blowing it was amazing and how often did you go after that was it a i year went every thing? year okay yeah, i went every year probably with the exception of two years uh-huh. probably one or two years i didn't go but I, I i usually went for auto salon and sometimes if i was lucky enough i would go a second time you know to go shoot cars when it was warmer just to <clears> just <throat> to shoot cars or at another event just to shoot cars. Because they do have that other event, the uh, Osaka. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, Auto Messe. Auto I've, Messe. I've actually never been to that. Okay. Um, because it was always too close to mm-hmm. Auto Salon. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And yeah. uh, usually it was like, ooh, you know, they would, they would discourage that. They're like, that's too close together. You got to spread it out. So usually, usually there's so many cars to shoot at Auto Salon that you sometimes don't get to them all. So you're like, okay, I'm going to schedule for later in the year. I'll come back and I'll finish shooting the rest of them. So we go back. Gotcha. Or we find a, you know, if uh, somebody wants to bring us out for something, we'll go. Mm-hmm. Or some special project. Yeah, that, yeah. That's when we would make a second trip. So when you were out in um, in Japan for Auto Salon back in early 2000 versus when uh, we were all on the same p- 
playing that year maybe I've, i'm saying it was 2017 it probably yeah. i'm pretty sure it was 2017 yeah. what did you notice that changed in the uh the the automotive culture and the the actual culture of japan if anything uh well over the years like everything else uh you know things change um uh there was a lot more of um just uh there were a lot more tuned cars back then like hks had a huge presence like a lot of these companies that are there I, i'm i think for the most part a lot of the same companies are still the same mm-hmm. like mugen has always had the badass boo and um but you can definitely tell you know as the economy shifts you can see how the you know the displays change or they get smaller gotcha. um or of course you know um you know japan and the u.s they they can marry each other too where it's like oh kids are less interested in cars so you're not going to see a lot of this or a lot of that so it parallels mm-hmm. you, can, you can see it um but i think i want to say just just seeing people's coverage or when i would you know the last time i went it was like oh it's nice to see this kind of stuff here again you know because it's less there were less you know in the beginning it was a lot of there were a lot of the skylines, you know, these these halo cars that yeah. we didn't get in the US, but you know, there's less of that over the years as a new car, right? Mm-hmm. So um you know, there are those years where it, the the trend was K cars and you know, these big scooters or whatever, just cars that don't apply to the US market. Yeah. So there was a lot of that. And especially in like two thousand eight when the economy went, went down, people were not fixing up cars at all. Uh-huh. So you, you can see it. And did you guys notice that that hit in the economy with with the magazine with Super Street? For sure, yeah. I mean, through those years, you could you know there was selling less issues. I mean, back in two thousand three, two thousand two. I mean, we were selling the magazines were like thick. No they were way. Like phone books. Yeah. I mean, like two three hundred pages. And like you could sell anything. You yeah. Could put anything on cover. It was like selling like hotcakes. Yeah. Like, and then, of course, when it gets to 2008, 2010, you know, the magazines are very thin. You know, it's hard to find cars, you know, because people are not fixing them up as much. Yeah. So that's why it makes the job even tougher to find, you know, that the, the content. Yeah. So you've been in the industry for this long. Um, to you, what is like the uh, the glory days of it all? Oh, they're all glory years. I mean, if I... If I'm thinking about the best years, it's always the earliest. Yeah. Right. Because like I said, the, the, the times are so innocent, you know, there, you, you are effective. I mean, without realizing it, you're, you're creating, you know, those moments. Yeah. Right? Um, that's what made it so special. you know, when you, when you think about it, that's why people say, oh, the good old days. Right. Yeah. Cause you don't know what those next days are going to become. You don't know, you know, you don't know until they happen yeah. that they become those, those moments. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll always remember those, you know, the years in the late nineties, those are my favorite, like just being a kid, yeah. you know, not, not working at like, those are my favorite because you're just hanging out with your, with your homies. Yeah. Just doing car shit, shit that you love. That's, that's the best time. Do you feel like there's any way to, to replicate it this day and age? You know, I'm sure there's so many people your age or close to it that have the same memories and the same, n- same nostalgia of, I, of those times. I don't know if you can recreate it or at least know. something parallel to it. Mm, I don't know. It's tough. I mean, you just, like I said, you, you, it, you can't make those moments. Yeah. You, know, you can't like, you can't actively go out thinking, trying to make those moments. It doesn't happen. That yeah. Way. You know, they only happen by accident Yeah, or, you know, when you look back on it, you're like, oh, yeah, that was, remember that? You yeah. Know, like that, that's, that's what makes it special. You know, otherwise you, you can't go out trying to make it. Yeah. What's your most recent memory of having, um, you know, a time like that, a good time, you know, like the first time you went to the auto salon or SEMA or something like that, just mm. something mm. new and exciting or is everything just so, so numb now since you've done so much? No, um, I mean, I guess it's different because I'm not in the thick of it anymore. So it's a little bit harder to find those moments. Yeah. Um, but I would say, you know, with the new, 
the new events that are going on. So like for the longest time I thought, Oh, I would love to go to a grid life. Yeah. You know, or, you know, these things I see on social media, but you know, I'm, I'm not working at those magazines or whatever. I won't have a chance to go. Finally got to go last year because of some client work. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's nice to say, Oh man, it's nice to be at an event that I've never been to before. I have no, you know, some, some events like a formula D or SEMA or Tokyo, like you go through the motions, you, you know exactly what you're going to experience, you know, more or less like you have a, you have a blueprint of you go in there, you know, you're going to do this. You're going to go to the show for blank and then you're going to take a day off to go hang out and then you're going to fly home. But something, you know, an event that you've never been to, even though it's at a familiar track, Mm -hmm. this now is an opportunity to say, Oh, never been here. Don't know don't know anybody here again yeah so now you're back now. yeah it, it really brought back the nostalgia of oh i don't know anybody here now i've got to get to know these people hey you're a local where can we go eat dinner tonight yeah you know or is there a spot that you know they're like hey we got there's a car meet let's go i'm like let's go right yeah so yeah it it'll bring back those it triggers the memories what uh grid life did you go to El, uh road atlanta this past one yes oh really yeah i was there too oh you were yeah <laughs> But you didn't have a booth or anything? No, no, yeah. I just went to hang out. Okay, yeah. um, I got some buddies in Atlanta, oh, cool. and my cousin, he's uh, he's actually never flown out of California. Wow. Yeah, so he's never really traveled. Yeah. And um, earlier last year, what year are we? Huh? 2020, yeah, 19. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> Corona's got me all fucked yeah. up right now. But, right. <laughs> but um, yeah, he's never traveled, and I was going to go to the event, and I told him, look, dude, come with me and uh let's go have a good time yeah. you know we went out there it was awesome man it was hot yeah hotter than hell i Definitely think that was one was. thing I, I totally did not miss was the and that was the thing about traveling when i was younger mm-hmm. it was like oh my god you go to these events in the middle of, you know it's so hot and humid. yeah I, dude. For, I totally forgot what it was like i was like oh this is what i don't miss yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> for yeah sure. But the the grid life events are awesome. Man. They're dope. Um, they they have really a lot of production yeah. into them. Yeah. And uh, shout out to Chris, man. That's yeah. that's really a dope event for sure. I would like to make it to another one. Uh, I don't think they're doing Road Atlanta anymore. I want to go to their whatever the OG the I Chicago think it's one. Gingerman. Yeah. Is, gin- yeah. I, I want to go to that. Me too, man. I'm, I've been I'm wanting big to on go. like these. Uh, I love watching all these uh, these underground drift events, so like mm-hmm. Final Bout. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I want to yeah. go to those. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. I've never been to any of them, so yeah. If anybody wants to get me out there, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, me too. Let's go. <laughs> I'm tagging along. Yeah. yeah, dude. There, dude. There's something about drifting, man. That's like wow. Yeah. I, I just I would love to do it. You know, yeah. that's probably my favorite automotive sport to watch. Yeah. You know, drifting. I would love to be a part of it. I would love to drift. Yeah, I've never tried it before. It's tough. Yeah. I, I tried once. Really? It's challenging. I mean, you really, I mean, driving a car is one thing. And then to try and get it to do something that it doesn't really want to do is even tougher. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's one good thing about going to a grid life event, man. You just go there and you just see these guys going yeah. balls out. And, they are crazy. And it's not just, you know, local guys or small dudes. They have a big pros there too, yeah. which is really, really cool. Yeah. And they're always ahead of the curve as well for having like, you know, a live podcast there yeah. and, and things like that. Yep. And the media as well, the, they'll have videos up like as soon as at, right after the video happens, yep. somebody will go edit it real quick and then you'll look on their Instagram and yep. it's up. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Huge shout out to uh grid life. Uh, have you ever made it to uh, H day before? No, that's really? another, that's another one that's on my hit list because I, uh, I've known Javier. That's Javier. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Javier, Javier Ortega for a long time. And, uh, I also know, um, Brian. Yeah. From Brian from Macy Brace. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, like, I knew those Brian. guys. Yeah. When I was going to E town, yeah. all the Naira races. Oh, wow. Day. Yeah. So I've always wanted, I, I think, um, I think East coast Honda events are, they're on a different level. They are definitely. So I, I've, yeah, Brian, I've been telling you for years. I want to go. Uh, yeah. So hope, hopefully I get out to one of those two. Yeah, I, maybe I you can see. make it out this year. Yeah. This year's going to be a weird one though, man. Yeah. I don't know what the hell is going to happen. Uh 2020's already started off very horribly and it just seems to keep going down that trend. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen, man. How uh how concerned are you with with what's going on with the coronavirus right now? Uh I'm 
I'm pretty concerned. Uh, I think the one thing, uh, you know, it's very hard to, you know, you, you can definitely see people that are very, like, you're see seeing very lots of different sides of people. Yeah. It's bringing out a lot of good. It's bringing out a lot of, like, ooh, I didn't know this about these people. At the same time, uh, the one thing I read about today was I just have to, you just have to remember to be, um, just have to have some empathy yeah. because everybody's dealing with this their own way. It's okay to be scared. Yeah. It's okay. You know, I feel like we as a people, you know, uh, my mother told me that she's like, you know, if we're going to dance in the rain, let's do it together. Yeah. So this is an opportunity, I think, for people to, I hope people do less of, uh, you know, taking it out on, you know, I don't like seeing, you know, Chinese businesses go down yeah. because people think, oh, I'm going to eat Chinese food. I'm going to get sick. There's a lot of it's bringing out some very ugly qualities of people unnecessarily racist. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not into that, you know, which is making people very scared, you know. So I, I really do hope, you know, people take a moment to, you know, breathe. Yeah. You know, help their fellow person. Just be kind, you know, because we're all going to. It's going to affect everybody. It is, you know, so we just need to be very, very cautious and just be kind to one another. Yeah. It's important. Definitely, man. This is, uh, this is throwing us for, for a loop for yeah. sure. You know what? It's so weird, man, looking back and maybe since you're a little older, you might see this parallel as well. Back in, uh, 2000, you know, when, when Bush was president, I remember going to warp tour and people chanting, you know, I hate Bush or what have you, T-shirts with Bush on them, like that they hate him. And then after the tragedies of 9-11, it's like everything turned around because we had to realize that you know, we have a little bigger problems than just a president that we're not happy with, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when me and my wife were talking, about, she was saying, I think the last time globally that people really kind of had the conversation together was... 9 11 yeah and yeah i was yeah i was i was still at, i was in my infancy at super street back in the day when that happened mm -hmm. i remember that i was on a trip and uh, i just remembered couldn't get a flight home you know my dad and my you know girlfriend at the time they had to drive out to come get me i was, oh, in, wow. I was in arizona thankfully i wasn't far yeah um you know and that and they you know i was on a i was on a business trip so i was being put up in a hotel oh, so it wasn't shit. it wasn't bad you know, but it was just such a, it was a huge tragedy. And just, you know, of course, you know, when the airlines are shut down, I think that was the last time, mm -hmm. you know, nationwide. I don't think it's, it's it could happen here. For, yeah. It, it feels like it can it, go that it way. It feels like it may go that way. Probably, you know, could be next week I've heard. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I just, I remember at the time it was crazy and, and you, everything work, you know, personally, it stops. Yeah. You know, the whole world stops and you're just like, okay, we need to focus on you know, what's at hand. Yeah. And I mean, the really, really beautiful thing that came out of, of so much tragedy was that you saw everybody come together as exactly. a humanity. Exactly. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't about uh, d democratic Republic race, anything like that. You know, every single person had the flag on their car. Yeah. You know, the window, it the was, one that goes on the window, everyone very, had yeah, it. I just remember that. I remember when they would encourage people, Oh, you know, go outside with the candle, light it and, you know, just be with your, fellow person and i remember walking down the street like man i just met all these neighbors i yeah. never saw in my life and it's just like everybody was to you know kind of they were sad together yeah i mean i'm i'm trying to look at it through a whole positive way you know because that's all that you can do and hopefully after all of this stuff stops maybe everybody could realize you know everybody's human you know this whole cancel culture that we have and you got to watch what you say and you you have to just walk on eggshells i mean that's probably not the right way to start looking at things when we have real life problems yeah. going on. That's going to affect everybody. It's so kind from, of like uh, mother nature is hitting the reset button. Exactly. Right now. And I don't, maybe we are overdue for it. <laughs> uh, yeah. We might be 10 years overdue for it, man, yeah. because shit's just been ramping up, you yeah. know, not that I'm wanting people to, you know, die or anything, but meaning just our way of thinking. Yeah. Know, reset our, you know, the way that we, treat each other yeah you know, yeah like you said uh, you know me personally i'm not more concerned about the the virus itself rather than the uh the hysteria that's coming along yeah. with it you know it's uh it's crazy it's yeah 
And it's, I, I think that we've been coasting through life and that's why we have so much time to worry about, you know, politics or social media or this person said this in 2010 or what have you, you know, that we didn't focus on, hey, if something bad happens, we're not really that very well prepared, you yeah. know, especially if something bad happens yeah. in China where most of our product supplies, you know, all of that comes from is this is like the perfect storm yeah for things yeah and um it's already affecting our community you know car shows are already uh canceling dates oh, changing everything. dates yeah 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 um this is coming out on monday so tomorrow which or yesterday which was sunday should have been tuner evo but that's not gonna happen anymore Oh, in LA. Yeah, it's not going to wow. happen. And we were supposed to be there. And it's just, I feel bad for those guys. You know, Jay came from Puerto Rico to Orlando, from Orlando to here, you know, getting everything ready. And I'm sure that that was on the back of his mind. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, certainly at this point, it's, it's always, I think it's, I mean, it's safer. Definitely. Hopefully. Just, just, yeah. I'm, Again, just, at this time, this could be a totally different rabbit hole to go down. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely, man. Yeah, just at but this point, for sure. From from last week to this week, if if you would have told me what went on this week, last week, I said, you're crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, it wouldn't have been out of the question. Yeah. Yeah, so everybody listening, man, I hope you guys are being safe out there and wash your hands and try not to be around any big crowds. Yeah. That you don't need to be. Yeah. So let's go ahead and take it to the uh, to your EF, man. Tell me about sure. that. Uh, so the, the the EF that I have now, this is kind of my oh. midlife crisis slash, <laughs> uh, you know, my tribute to my high school years. Yeah. It is a mixture of the car that I wish I could have built back then, but you know, taking all the experiences I've had, you know, with cars over the years and it's all together. In yeah. One. So it's got, you know, the super fins that I was lusting after when I was a kid and, but it's got all those JDM parts that I was yeah. looking for when I was, you know, discovering all of that. Um, the color is, uh, you know, is, is, a you know, not the exact color, but it's also a tribute color to junior Asper's car. So he's another one of my I idols. Okay. Know? So he had, you know, another fast EF, you know, in that blue color. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, uh, it was lucky to have built it. I think when I did, because, uh, those parts I cannot find anymore. So I think I picked the right time. I think I started building it around 2008. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was, uh, a friend of mine, um, Jerry, who was doing the I Love Racing t-shirts. Got you. He he had this car. You know, he It was bone stock, and he said, I don't really want it anymore. I said, oh, and I said, this might be kind of interesting. Go back to a Honda, because yeah. I think up until that point, I um, I got long got rid of the EG. I had a 240, um, and I think I just wanted something fun again. And I said, oh, that's a good uh, yeah. it's my high school car. <laughs> Not the exact car, obviously, but I said, I would love to build another one of these things again. So I went crazy, you know, started tracking down, you know, I had to look up all the, the new JDM parts importers. Yeah. And I, I can't remember who I bought the parts from anymore, but, um, so I was like, you know, a friend of mine, he says, I got the Mugen exhaust. I said, I'll buy it. Uh, he says, Oh, I already have someone that's going to take. I said, how much to, if to, I'll buy it off you right now. He's yeah. like, this price is like, done. <laughs> so I just started collecting parts, you know, valve cover, you know, all sorts of shit. And we're like, all right, let's, let's make this a magazine car. Let's, you know, a project car. And then we, we built it to go against project car magazine uh -huh. CRX. And so they took my old motor, they turbocharged it. And then we're like, okay, we're going to go race in the eighth mile. See who, of course it beat me because it's turbocharged. It's got torque. Yeah. <laughs> I was just a stock B 16 a, but yeah, it was, that was a fun project. Um, and of course I did the, the rocket bunny kit. Um, so I got that from Mira, mm -hmm. you know, he had that on the, that his, he has a famous EF okay. white one. Yeah. Like the, it was like an Osaka, you know, the Kanjo car. And, uh, for years I was, I would joke, joke with him and said, you gotta make me a buy. I want to 
I want, can you make that body kit? He's like, I'll just give it to you. You know, and I, he's like, I don't know. I, you know yeah. I always thought it was just our, in, our inside joke. Yeah. And then one day he, he was like, okay, look, I'm going to send it to you. What's your address? Right. And then, uh, you know, a couple of days later, you know, my dad says, Hey, you got this big box. From no Japan. way. And so I go home and I'm like, I'm like, Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. How did you guys meet? Uh, through the magazine. Mm. So, um, yeah. Mm, uh, Sean Klinghoffer uh-huh. and Charles, you know, we were all on staff at the time. They're like, Oh dude, you got, look at this rocket bunny. This is dope, right? It's like this underground, like, you know, street racing, uh-huh. you know, highway racing thing. I was like, what the hell is rocket bunny. Yeah. You know? And he's like, Oh, these guys, he makes the body. Like, look at these EFs. Like, Oh, that's sick. So we saw it at auto salon and, I don't know, 2008, 2009, something Whoa, like that. Whoa, yeah. no way. But that wasn't when we met, made the, the relationship with them. It, okay. was, it was actually when he started doing the um, the body kit for the, the FRS. Yeah. And um, so I was like, yeah, I just want, you know, we want to feature your car, blah, blah. And yeah, that that's, you know. So was that um, when that brand started getting popular was from the FRS? Yeah, that's probably, uh, that's about when it started taking off. So it was that 2013? Uh-huh. 2012, 2013, around that time. Yeah. Does he speak uh, English? Uh, not very well. Uh, usually I have a translator or we use, you know, Google Translate. Gotcha, it's gotcha. It's pretty easy to, to, I think he understands enough that we, we get by. Gotcha. Get by. Yeah. Dude, he's blown up, man. He's, he's, he's big. He's so cool. Um, he's probably one of the most generous really? guys, you know, that doesn't you know he's not expecting much back from you but you know he loves that yeah he's very giving very uh, cool yeah. man yeah I, w- I would love to um have a conversation with him i've just met him before yeah. you know i met him through uh you know yasu mm-hmm. yeah i met him through yasu shout out to yasu yeah man. yasu's the same way dude yeah yasu's so awesome yasu's great, uh, yeah. anything that we ever need when we're out there he's always takes care of us yes. and it, it's, yes. it's super cool man yes um I didn't even know that there was a Rocket Bunny kit for the EF. He only has that one. Yeah. And so now you have it. I have it. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So didn't you just come back out with the car again? Um, or did you do anything different to it or you just started bringing it out again? No. Well, so, yeah, most recently I had the car in the Peterson Museum. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So I, I um, Jim at Formula D... Uh, one of the co-founders at Formula D, he, uh-huh. he was helping the Peterson was, you know, they were looking for cars to be part of their, you know, Japanese classic yeah. exhibit. And I guess Jim had proposed, he's like, Hey, I've got this, you know, this friend who's, he has this like nineties era, you know, period, correct Honda. Yeah. You know, and he's like, Hey, do you want to put your car in? He said, I, I can't guarantee it. He's like, but you want to just like submit photos and just, you know, if they pick you, you pick you. I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll just, I'm not even thinking about, oh yeah, they're going to pick my car. I'm just like, well, I hope I, I, my car is not anything near like rye wires yeah, or, you know, a lot of these other cars that are like very pristine. I mean, like mine's a little, if you look closely, it's rough around the edges, right? Gotcha. So I never say it's like, the, you know, the cleanest thing, but so I said, so, okay, I'll just send it in. If, if they are cool with it, cool. If not, it's not, I'm, I won't be offended. And he said, hey, they're interested. You want to, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, hell yeah. Nobody gets this opportunity ever. Yeah. So I said, yeah. I said, a year? Sure. You know, I don't, I don't have to worry about moving it for a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, so yeah. And yeah, me and my wire, we were talking about, it. he's like, yeah, you're going to be, it's like, yeah. And, then, and he was like, well, it's only going in the vault. And I was like, oh shit. But his car is still there. Right. So yeah. his car has been like way over the limit. Uh-huh. So I'm like, dude, that's great for him. And you, ha- you, you got your car back already. Yeah, yeah, it's got been, you. yeah, it's been home for, yeah, oh yeah, over a year now. Nice. Yeah. So looking at the the Honda community in specific, from the past when you first got into it to now, um, did you foresee the community going the way that it did? No, not at all. What are uh, some of the things that really surprised you? Oh, the changes over the years. Um. I don't know. I think I'm just, I think we're all, if you ask anybody, I think we're all just amazed that Honda, the brand that did not intentionally set out to do this sort of thing with the car became this icon. Yeah. Right. I mean, when you really think, well, 
it would be hard to say for your generation to look back because you you don't have that yeah. memory right so you can't you don't know so like at the time you know what a lot of people don't realize is you know that that beginning of the import scene was you know these are cars that were getting mostly hand-me-downs from their parents you know they were they were affordable they they were not designed or you know they weren't destined to be you know what it is today yeah right probably if those things didn't happen the civic type r as we know it today probably would not exist yeah right yeah um so it really is a it's a combination of like again it's bringing back those special like those moments created what it is now yeah you know, it helped honda in the sense right they were just making an economical commuter car they weren't thinking oh these kids are going to fix it up it's going to be in a movie and then yeah. years later, we're going to make this, you know, fast production car. Yeah. They're not thinking that at all. We could know? have just been the Camry. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah, the Accord would have just been the Accord, you know, but kids were like, no, I'm going to cut the springs and slam it and put a system in it and do this. And it was just, it's a very specific, you know, it's a very special car culture. Yeah. You know? Now, uh, speaking of the movie, when Fast and Furious 1 came out, yeah. um, what was the, what was it like before and after? I remember when they were getting ready to film it. I was like, "Oh God, what is this?" You know, you know, because in my head, I'm just thinking, oh, "I'm this JDM guy." Yeah. They're trying to build cars, like, like, oh, like, what are they doing? Yeah. Right? And I was like, "I'm not gonna have any part of this." Mm -hmm. You know, but I wasn't the boss, right? So, I mean, just personally, as a as a as an enthusiast, mm -hmm. a car guy, I was like, "I'm not." Like, they're like all my friends went. They're like, "I'm gonna be an extra." And they, <laughs> yeah. you know, RJ was putting the yeah. money, blah, blah 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 blah. I'm like, I don't want to. I'm. I didn't go to any of that. I yeah. didn't go to any of the behind the scenes. Really? None, none of that. It was just, I would just write about the stuff in the magazine because I was, I was so anti <laughs> against it. And then like, I don't think, yeah, I never saw the movies in the theater. You didn't you even know. go watch it? No. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like, not like I was like boycotting it. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I was not about that. But then when it happened, it, it turned everything around. Like it gave, it gave new life. Like people all of a sudden wanted to fix up their cars. So we're like, holy shit. Right. Yeah. And that's when it like made the magazine, like at that time, like boom, mm. like all the magazines were just selling like hot. Like I said, you could feature whatever, whatever the hell you wanted. Yeah. And it was going to sell because of that, because of the movies. And then later on, you know, when it started, um, you know, as it got, was it? So it was, uh, too fast, too furious. And then when it got Tokyo, Tokyo drift, drift is the yeah. third one. Okay. So Tokyo, Tokyo drift is when I think by that time for sure, um, you know, the, the movie companies and, and even the car companies or, you know, manufacturers that were participating, like now they were asking us, Oh, can like, you know, we, we want you to help us mm. promote this. And so, you know, like, yeah, now they're, you know, some of the films are better. Like Tokyo Drift, like I was cool. Like I yeah. like watching, I went to the movie premiere, Yeah, you know, because Subaru was, you know, pr you know, promoting or whatever it was. And then, um, yeah, I think that like the last one was maybe like fast, I don't know. If, I don't even know what the seventeen five. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, now it's like now it's totally less about the cars, and now it's like a, just a big entertainment thing. Yeah. They're pretty decent now. I like them now. Two is my least favorite. One is still not. I'm not big on. But, really? Yeah. Three I like a lot. Yeah. Four, five for sure I like. The, the, Which one was five? Ah, uh, no, I don't remember the. Point. I remember there was one with the yellow EG at the funeral. That one was a pretty. Uh, uh, yeah. Because it had an EG, so I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I I couldn't place the uh, the cars into which movie. After yeah, movie. after Tokyo Drift, it all just blends yeah. together yeah. with just like mad killings and yeah, the spinoffs. <laughs> the spinoffs are entertaining. Like the Hobbs and Shaw was pretty good, and then I don't know, Fast Nine. Mm -hmm. I mean that's. That's postponed now, but I mean, I'm sure. is it really? Yeah, I think they, I think they postponed it. Sam told me they had po postponed it to, uh, I don't know if it's next year or end of the year. It's de definitely postponed. I think it was getting ready to, uh, to um, come out to the theater. Yeah. Shit is crazy right yeah. now, man. Do you ever think that they'll be able to come out with a movie that's geared towards like the enthusiasts, or is the market just not big enough? Hmm. Like what Fast and Furious 1 should have been. Mm, probably not. Yeah, I think it's it's shifted to that point where, I don't know, who's to say it could, but I, I can't see it happening. I just think the, the industry, is, it's reached, it's turned to that level where 
I think just for hardcore enthusiasts, it's probably not enough or it's not compelling yeah. to create a movie out of it. Yeah, man. Things are things are really getting weird right now. You know, a weird trend that's going on is um, these like ultra famous rappers starting to have like uh, imports in their music videos and oh, things like Travis that. Travis Scott. Yeah. Travis Scott. And then there's also been just a couple others like, you know, dabbling into the import community. Yeah. I, I, I always wonder, are they actually? In, well, I, I think Travis, he's got an E30. Mm -hmm. right and then frank ocean has his too right so i um, you know i assume they are car enthusiasts on some level but it's i mean of, yeah how much time would you have to be able to enthuse you know true true uh, i know tyler the creator has uh old school bmw i'm not sure oh yeah maybe what, maybe it's him yeah. what year um there's also that rapper i'm not sure if you know him about xavier wolf no. He's a he's a BMW guy okay. too, and a lot of his songs are about uh, like early on was about like drifting and things oh. like that. It was pretty cool, um, but yeah, I'm I'm interested to see where that goes. Yeah, it's like kind of two sides in me. Yeah. You know, I, I like I like right now that my hobbies are are completely separate. I mean, in the automotive community, yeah, you will have people that are into music and stuff like that. Yeah, but I'm not sure if I want that those guys to come over. Yeah, I well, I think it's I think it's important to keep certain hobbies separated. Otherwise, they you know when they blend too much, then it's just like ugh, there's no uh, distinction between them. So, yeah, it's nice to have like my little sneaker hobby, you know, going yeah. or like you know the the clothes and then. Um, yeah, and then the, the car stuff is, I mean, the car stuff is always, always there. Yeah. I think that's, people will always know it. They're like, dude, you're always still at these events. I, I, that's another thing. I think it's still important to, people ask, why do you still come to these things if you're not at the magazine anymore? It's like, well, you know, this is sometimes the only way I see my friends. Yeah. It's another way to just stay on top of, you know, just stay on top of car culture, just to see what's going on. I don't want to dip away so much as like, you come back like, well, what the hell's going on? No, yeah. This way I'm not surprised. Yeah. And I can, you know, continuously, you know, look forward to something. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, such as RJ, man, it seems like every weekend he's at some kind of event. Yeah. Yeah. Even during the weekdays too. Yeah. Like, man, this guy does more car stuff than I do. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's the benefit working at McGuire's. Yeah. He gets to go to all these concourse events. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish I, I, I love going to those kind of, you know, those, you know, these classic exotic, like these multi-million dollar cars. Yeah. Like, I'm never going to afford that, but I love looking at them. Yeah. So what's your sneaker collection up to now? Oh, I shouldn't say because I don't want my <laughs> wife to know. <laughs> but uh, Let's name some heavy hitters in it then. Uh, I have a few off-white Nikes. Um, I have some Yeezys. Which Yeezys do you have? Uh, I, you know, I, I was into sneakers a lot, obviously when I was a kid mm -hmm. and then I, you know, whenever I got really heavy into it around 2004, mm -hmm. 2005. It's so like when dunks, dunks were got you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were big back then. Yeah. But they weren't crazy hard to get. And then now because Travis Scott <laughs> dunks are like super popular. Dude, again. those new ones are sick. Yeah. Those are like crazy crazy and, yeah, uh, like 12 1300 bucks i think i oh saw on stock x yeah i i'm yeah so now nowadays i've probably gone a little overboard with, with some supreme stuff or, you know a lot of it was like i was just trying to i don't know what kickstarted to get back into but i think there was uh, you know i missed when the yeezys first came out mm -hmm. like I, I i knew about them but i was totally not into it like i wasn't into the clothes i wasn't into the sneakers i i of course i knew i have supreme stuff from you know 12 years ago mm -hmm. But, you know, like now it's just exploded. And, uh, um, you know, then I got a little, you know, insane with trying to trying to get stuff. You know, it's like, oh, now I just want to see if I can get stuff. And yeah. I you know, I'm not making a big, big living off flipping stuff. But, yeah. You know, it's fun to kind of do it a little bit because, you know, some of your other friends are doing it. Yeah. So that that's kind of, you know, the probably the only not a super huge hobby, but small one yeah into right now i really got into it about 2012 and uh that's when like the um were you, were you in the jordans obviously yeah yeah it was when they re-released the uh cement fours and then right before that was like the cement threes in black friday 2011 if i'm not mistaken so I got, I got a good story about the cement fours. Yeah. So the very first time they retroed those shoes in 98, uh -huh. 
98 or 99, something like that. I remember, you know, Nike Town was just down the street from the Super Street office. And I remember, you know, I was reading about it. They're like, where I was like, oh, those are the shoes I want. I never, I got the military blue ones. When yeah, I was a kid. yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But I could never get the, you know, the, the OG pair. So I was like, I'm going to go line up yeah. at, at Nike Town. I went at like seven in the morning. There's only like four people waiting in line. <laughs> I guess, it, I, I don't know, maybe it wasn't, it definitely wasn't as big that morning, I remember, as, you know, lining up at some, or trying to win a raffle or yeah. whatever these days, or just getting off sneakers, which mm-hmm. is a pain in the ass, but I went that day, and, you know, I was like, oh, I was like, man, these are, I was like, fuck, these are expensive, $100, because so like, I was so used to buying these $20 shoes, <laughs> Vans or yeah, Chucks, yeah, right, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, but oh, I always wanted these. Now I get to, I get to rock them. And I just remember the girls like, you want to buy more? You can buy more than one pair. I'm like, nah, I'm good with one. In hindsight, I should just bought like. A, Hell yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah, I love those shoes. Those are one of my personal favorites. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm really a fours guy for yeah. sure. Um, there was a time where I was getting sneakers all the time, and then just like it got too crazy where they were doing the raffles and you couldn't even, they were doing the bots and all that. And I remember I would wake up at like f- five o'clock in the morning to try to order them, and it would be up for a half hour and just ruins your Saturday. Like, shit. I didn't yeah. Get them. My, my wife knows that very well. I <laughs> yeah. apologize. <laughs> No, she's always like, oh, she's like, are you getting another raffle ticket today? I'm like, mm. <laughs> she's like, I know you're getting a raffle ticket. I'm like, mm. <laughs> she's like, stop tagging me on these raffle entries. She's like, nobody wins these things on Instagram. I'm like, I know, but I just got to try. I feel like I need to try. Yeah. yeah. I just picked up the, um, the threes, cement threes, um, I don't even know what they're called, but they're like the red ones. Yeah, those are Yeah, dope. sick, dude. And I, I just went on the website and just bought them straight from there. Yeah. And it's dope because they have like the Nike on the back yeah. and stuff. They look really nice, but the ch- the the trend has definitely changed, man. Oh you could God. see like Jordans on the shelf yeah. right now. Yeah. And everything has moved over to, you know, Yeezys and, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, if anybody out there has any of the um, Nike Yeezys, I would oh. love to have some red Octobers, yeah. man, or some the That's Blinks, funny. right? The the Blinks were the the, the first. Uh, I don't know the exact. The like the, the pink. Yeah, pink I, ones. I, I know which ones you're referencing. Yeah, yeah. pink and like tan or whatever. Something I think they were like called that. Blinks yeah. for sure. But uh, damn, any of those, man. I, I should have got some at that time because when they first came out, you know, the the prices were expensive, but nothing like they are today. Yeah, that's why there's those moments where, I mean, I had those dunks from, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Some of them were dead stock. Yeah. And I just, like, before, like, that whole, before Travis got made, I was like, I'm going to get rid of them because I'm not wearing these. No one's going to, no one wants them. They're like, dunks are dead. And then all of a sudden I'm looking, I was like, I shouldn't have got rid of them. Because I'm looking, I'm like, damn, I could have sold it for 300. (laughs) Cause I wasn't ever going to wear them, yeah. you know, but luckily I, I kept a few pairs, you know, that I had worn and, you know, now that I wear them, they're, you know, they've, they've yellowed nicely. Oh yeah. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, dude, these are, you know, my friend's like, dude, it's kind of dope with the, with the aging, you know, mm-hmm. they're like, I was like, should I, should I, should I clean them? He's like, nah, just, just wear just them. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, they're, they're, yeah. So now they're like, you know, wearing some of these old shoes are, you know, they're kind of cool. Again. But yeah. But some of them disintegrate, like the, the military four, uh, military blue fours that came out in like, 2008 or 2010 or whatever it was they're starting yeah. starting to disintegrate like, oh really you know the oh, you know the, the shoelace tabs yeah, yeah like uh-huh. all four of them broke off so now i just i ripped them off i'm like fuck it i'm just gonna wear it without it. and then like, from wearing them or just dead no, stock? just age what yeah the, the shoes they will eventually crumble uh-huh yeah like the 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 cement forest from 98 they're starting to disintegrate got you yeah, but i'm just i just leave it in the box like just it's just a nostalgic thing i have those military force from back then i haven't checked them though <laughs> oh shit yeah i guarantee you take it out of storage and you will see cracking and, <laughs> oh and damn the shoe bowl yeah it, yeah it, it's just that's it's the climate and you know unless you keep it sealed i think even if you keep it sealed and it'll eventually this this is just it's just pla- uh the material is degrading yeah yeah because I, I put the mil- and i was like oh my god these things broke off these things broke off <laughs> And then the, you know, the, the, on the side, it started cracking. I'm like, oh, I better not wear this. Cause the, you know, I've, you know, my f- other friends of mine, they're like, yeah, I've gone out with these shoes and the sole like completely <laughs> rips off. They're like, bro, look at your feet. He's like, oh shit. You know? So yeah, now I know, oh, you know, it's probably not a good idea to hang on to a shoe for too long of a time. You know, it's like, if you're yeah. going to collect it, you collect it for a time. Now I think it's just, you know, just move on, just sell it because I don't want to look back. Yeah. 
20 years and I was like, oh, I should just got rid of this stuff, right? I mean, yeah. unless you you know you're going to keep it and say, like, this is, you know, something you want to yeah. collect. Yeah. I mean, they do look super cool if you have, like, a first generation in, like, a case. I don't even have that. it's all falling apart. All the boxes, are they're, they're in the closet, like, hidden away, or they're just stacked in piles. Yeah. Like, like yeah. What Some size are you? 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did you ever get the uh, the diamond dunks? Uh, no, mm. no. I I remember at the time too. The those were so expensive. Yeah. Just I, yeah. But the funny thing was back then, it was like, oh, if you couldn't get it on drop day, because I think most people you just wait in line, you could get it. Yeah. But there was also like I got most of my stuff on eBay. There were no fakes back then. Yeah. For most things, and all you had to do is pay a twenty percent, you know, tax on it, right? And but now it's like, oh my god, you're paying triple the price of a shoe. Like it's definitely not fun. Yeah. So now I know most shoes. If I can't get it for retail, I just let it go. Yeah. You know, I'm down it, to pay a little over yeah. retail if I want them. But this whole game that everybody's playing, nah. Yeah. I'm out on that. Yeah. Because at this day and age. I'm not buying shoes to hopefully they 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 turn into a you know a profit or something. You're I want to wear them. Yeah. All the shoes that I get from you know probably at least the last two or three years, as soon as I get them, I'll just wear them the next day. And yeah. I don't go anywhere. I just come here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, my wife probably wants me to do the same. She's like, <laughs> she's like, you have all these boxes here, and you don't wear. She says, you said you were going to wear some of these. I'm like, yeah. no. And then some, and then someone's like, all right, I'm just going to let them go. Yeah. And some of them, they happen to make a profit. I'm like, cool. Uh, I didn't lose any money. Yeah. It's all I'm not losing money. Some of them, I take a little hit. Like the Supreme, well, Supreme stuff is like the worst thing right now. So it's just take it and just move it, move it. Move Would it. you have Supreme? Um, I have a few box logo sweaters. Mm. Uh, I got a t-shirt from the last season. Um, I mean, I, I I largely try and just go for things I like. Did you get the dunks? The no, the one no, from no. back in the no, day. No, no, oh, those no, are no. so yeah. fire, dude. Yeah. Those are expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. Were you ever on a uh, Nike Talk? No, no, wasn't. Uh, yeah, I think that was probably about the time where it was like it was going back in you know Super Street and like you know very very like little bit into clothes yeah. and sneakers. So it was just you know it's getting a lot of like you know billionaire boys club and oh gotcha. bathing ape stuff and then yeah get, get a couple pairs of dunks some jordans but that was it and then i would switch back and then for a long time i was wearing just chucks mm-hmm. plain chucks plain t-shirts plain no logos no nothing yeah and then now i'm kind of back in a little bit in the streetwear stuff so do you used to wear a uh, pro club tall tees a w- <laughs> pro club you don't remember no no no, no, no. There was that 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 era where uh, you just wear the blank tee, the tall, long uh, tees. Uh, I mean, I probably wore some kind of cheap. Yeah, it was whatever cheapest brand I could get. Yeah, Tim's and then the uh, new never era wore, fitted. Never, never, <laughs> no, I never wore. No, I never wore. I, I don't wear hats very often. No, I got a I got a big head, so it's very hard for me to over an eight. No, I'm a seven and three quarters. Oh, that's up there, dude. Yeah, that's, you got a big brain though. That's Let's why. See. So, yeah, I, I don't look very good in hats, so I, I typically don't buy hats. Bro, I wear hats almost every single day. Yeah. And I don't know why. Like, I dig my hair sometimes, yeah. too, you know, but it's just, it's one of those kind of habits. You, you got to have the right, I feel like it looks good only on certain people. Yeah. That's why I, I never wear a hat. <laughs> um, That's crazy, dude. It's like all these hobbies and then, you know, one comes a little more important and then you like forget about a hobby you know yeah i mean unfortunately you know the the car stuff you know more recent years takes the back you know no pun in the back seat yeah 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 it's just is there um you know will i you know it's just the certain priorities in life you know you don't think about the cars often so it just but i'm I'm glad i still have it yeah you know there were points like oh would you sell like yeah right price comes along so but i think uh you know What's the point? I don't want to build another car again. And I, you know, although in the past year or past two years, I have thought about, oh, I'd love to get an ITR mm. or uh, get an EK, yeah, and like you know, just build another car again. But um, probably got to put that on hold for a while while we <laughs> while the world waits to see what happens. Yeah, I know. Uh, twenty twenty one is going to be the year. Yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely, man. Uh, I would like to build something too. You know, I have the the heavy in the streets EG yeah. out there, which needs to be put back together. But that's like 
that's a build already. Yeah. It's done. I, I wish I had something new. Uh, you know who's been motivating me a lot is Rodriguez, man. Oh, with yeah. that new build that he's uh-huh. doing. He's uh he's got a lot of details in that car. And it's just so fun cuz every day he'll post up mm-hmm. like maybe like five pictures in mm-hmm. in one that shows the things that he's doing. Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Damn, dude, it's just that would be so cool." Yeah. You know? I that I I <clears throat> definitely miss the the building car, you know, part of life. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, now I got to get it down to a shop or, yeah, sometimes the time, you just don't have the time. I feel you, man. Yeah. So fast forward to today. Yep. What, what consumes your life? What, what are things that you're into today? What do you, what do you got going on? Um, I mean, a lot of it's just, it's work. It's uh, spending time with my new wife. Uh, when did you guys get married? I got, uh, got married last July. Oh, nice. Congratulations, Yeah, yeah thank man. you. Thank you. So it's, uh, um, you know, we're concentrating on, you know, hopefully we can start a family soon. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's just been a lot of spending time with my wife and um, getting, getting to, I mean, we've been living together for a while, but now it's just, you know, now that we're the unit, yeah, it, it's, uh, not really getting adjusted, you know, everybody says, Oh, how's married life? Same. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. The same as it was before. It's great. Fantastic. As long uh, as you find the right girl. Yeah. Definitely. Of course. Of course. Yeah, because uh, I've heard of some that turn crazy after you put that ring. On. No, no, I, I, I I'm very lucky. Uh, she, she's like I said, nothing changed. There's nothing like finding a, a great woman, man. Yeah, it just I agree. takes off so much weight from your shoulders. You yeah. don't have to worry about, you know, a a toxic relationship or not even having a relationship. You know, being alone yeah. in this world. Yeah, not not one aspect of it has been toxic. Not. Very cool. No, man. very, very no drama. Awesome. There. I'm sure it will come someday, but uh, so far, so far it's great. Do you guys have any hobbies together? Uh, I'm. We like to travel. Okay. Um, like travel, we like to find. She likes to find new places to eat for us. I mean, we're both big. Uh, I hate saying the word foodie. But, yeah. You know, we we definitely like to try. Uh, you know, whatever we can, whenever we travel to a different city. Um, yeah. That, that's probably that's probably what we enjoy doing the most dope man so before we get out of here dude um you've been in this industry for so long seen so much what do you think creates longevity say if there's somebody listening right now that wants to turn their hobby into um a career what steps did you take or what, what would you recommend i think uh today it's it's you just have to hopefully find the right connections. Connections is key mm-hmm. right now. And, you know, if it's some kind of trade or skill, you know, just make sure you're always on, you know, on top of whatever, I don't know, whatever can make you better at what you like to do. Just always stay on top of it. And um, just, I don't know, you just got to, sometimes it's a little bit of luck. Yeah. You know, it's being at the right time. Like I didn't seek to become an editor. That wasn't my goal in life. You know, I just kind of fell into it. Yeah. But at the same time, I knew that when I got into it, it's like, okay, I got to figure out the way to make myself better. So you got to write more. You got to shoot more, you know, trying to make this product better, you know. So whatever somebody's passion is, you know, I think if they can just, you know, harness that energy to just constantly... You know, Kobe, that Mamba mentality, you got to get into it a hundred thousand percent. You know, how bad do you want it? Yeah. If you don't want it that bad, maybe you shouldn't do it. Maybe it's not the right thing, you know, and if it takes people a few tries, a few things, different things to figure out what it is that they are great at, that's okay. You know, but definitely go for it. Yeah. You know, if you could go back, would there be anything that you would change? Um... Uh, no, because I wouldn't be at this point. Yeah. Most likely. Uh, of course I, you know, there were moments like, oh, I should have taken the risk, you know, for certain things. Yeah. But who knows what it would have turned out, you know, but that's why I would encourage people. Yeah. When you're younger, don't be afraid to take the risk. You know, if you can afford to, that afford doesn't necessarily mean monetary. It means if you have the ability to take the risk. You know, just try it. You know, if it doesn't work out, 
you know, you can always hopefully find something that, that works a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. I love it, bro. Thank you so much for coming, dude. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. It was very, uh, very good to talk to you and, and get to pick your brain on all this stuff. And, um, you've given me some names to, uh, hunt down. <laughs> I have no, I have no problem helping you. If you can, man, I would love that, it, dude. That should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, man. So before we get out of here, can you, uh, give everybody your socials where they can find you at? I'm always, uh, available at, at JDM Wong. JDM Wong. Never changes. Hell Across yeah, man. Yelp, Instagram. You Facebook. have a Yelp? Yeah. I'll Yelp you, bro. I, I think, I think it's JDM Wong. Yeah. Usually it, it's always, I, I pick, pick the one that I'll remember. So it's very rare that. Dope. I, I cannot choose that name. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Jonathan, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Of course, man. And thank you guys for listening. If you enjoy this uh, podcast, make sure you show uh, Jonathan some love. And please tell a friend, man. This is the only way that the podcast is going to grow is with your guys' help. So um, thank you for listening. And uh, once again, this is Downtime with Downstar, episode 151. And we out. Peace. Peace. <laughs>